Academy. In addition to rigorous academics and challenging athletics, this institution stresses character building through intimidation, humiliation, Come on, don't be such a wimp. and some homoerotic bonding. That was so cruel. Yeah, really. We're getting all up in the face of Rockstar's new PS2 title, Bully, right now on Cheat. Them and gives them a swirl. I'm Kristen Holt, and in this episode, we'll explore the dog eat dog world of Rockstar's Bully. Let's begin our tour of Bullworth Academy with a little orientation lecture. Welcome to Bullworth Academy, a renowned educational institution where even the most defiant of young minds can be nurtured and molded into an instrument of intellectual curiosity. A filthy, dirty, foul-mouthed, awful little vandal. Or not. In Bully, you'll face the harsh realities of the modern educational system. It's wedgie or be wedgied in these trenches. You may attend a class or two along the way, but you'll find that brass knuckles are handier than Cliff's notes in this town. And you'll be hitting the nerds much harder than you hit the books. Do your homework again! Sure you will. Bullworth Academy is full of the usual suspects. You'll meet a cast of social miscreants cribbed straight from the notebooks of John Hughes. There's the brains. Role-playing is the high point of human achievement. The jocks. How about we beat you in a game of dodgeball? The preps. Filthy Democrat! And the greasers. You're done, kid. Finished. Did they get here in a school bus or a time machine? Where does that leave you, you ask? Well, you get to be the badass mofo that schools them all. But you're the people's bully, fighting to protect the defenseless, atrophied, and generally brain-dead masses from the evils of high school. This school rewards losers and bullies. I just stand up to them. What's that, Mr. Thompson? You're right. All bullies should come with a nougat center as soft and creamy as Jimmy Hopkins. Passing missions and classes is fun but it's the interactions with the people of Bullworth that make Bully so much fun. Hopkins may say he's here to learn, but let's face it, Jimmy's all about the booty. After you pass your first English class, you'll gain the ability to exchange gifts for sexual favors. Uh, I mean, earn kisses with presents. Flowers and candy are the kiss currency in this world, where love can still be bought with simple carbohydrates. Here's a guide to getting it on at Bullworth Academy. Approach a girl and target her with the L1 button. This will oh, bring Jimmy, up the compliment so option. Nice of you. After you lavish her with attention, the X button will change to a picture of flowers or candy. Your ticket to hey. a smooch. If the little lady likes your gift, and she will, she'll allow you to plant one on her. If it were only this easy in real life. I can't wait to graduate so I can do that all the time. If you don't feel like spending money for a game of tongue twister, you can grab an unlimited number of flowers for free in front of the girls' dorm. Later in the game, kissing will give you a health bonus. A whole lot more wholesome than copping a feel off a streetwalker in the backseat of your Camaro, huh? <laughs> Buy curiosity is pretty much a requirement for graduation these days, so why not get some extra credit in early with this dreamy Aryan? I want to spend time with you, but not if you're cheap about it. Woo Blondie the same way you would any other girl, and you'll be slipping in a little slap and tickle in no time. I'm such a player. Oh, young love. But school isn't just one big love-in. You can also scare the uniforms off your fellow students. Mastering the art of the wedgie is the first step on the road to bully overlord. To do this, sneak up slowly behind an unsuspecting victim and yank away when the undie symbol pops up. Why does it always have to be me? Because as fun as making out can be, there's no greater satisfaction than the gift of the man ball. What gives you the right to do that to me? Let's let young Jimmy sleep for now. He has a full day of classes ahead of him after the commercial break. And as for you, here's a quick intimidation cheat. wouldn't be nearly as fun without the ability to intimidate and humiliate. Intimidating would-be ruffians with the thumbs down sign will send them running for the hills. When the circle button turns into a red fist, all signs are go for humiliating. And boy, is it fun. You're hitting yourself again. If you don't feel like running and hiding in town after a little petty vandalism, feel free to try and sweet talk your way out of doing time. 
Though this might just land you in Sing Sing. I'm the man. Graphics are not. Yeah, they got more flavor than a pistachio. No doubt. I'd whip you head to head. What? Squirrel, please. You have about as much skills as a chipmunk. Yo, mama's a chipmunk. Oh, no. He got denied just like you get denied by the lady. Shoot, if I had a ship like that, the girls would be all over me like salt on a peanut. Hells yeah. Hells yeah. PSP. Hells yeah. Edition. Now, like it or not, life isn't all assault and petty vandalism. You eventually have to attend classes at some point here at Bullworth Academy. Here's how to make the experience as painless as possible. Without class, school would just be one long nightmare of self-esteem crushing. <laughs> Learning about the history of Botswana or the area under a curve may seem useless, but without it, what rest would we have from the constant torture of the high school social hierarchy? You're dead, new kid! At Bullworth Academy, classes are opportunities to escape the pressures of being a click kingpin. And they come in the form of fun, bite-sized mini-games. Uh, don't be such a wimp! Classes run on a three-day repetitive schedule. So if you don't pass one the first time, it'll come around again. Here's our cliff notes to academic triumph. Watch it, whoosh! In art class, you draw boxes in an effort to reclaim a certain percentage of the canvas from the darkness of artist block. Avoid crossing paths with enemies like erasers and scissors and enclose them in boxes to eliminate them. Passing art will allow you to exchange gifts for kisses. And the more classes you pass, the higher your health bonus will be for a successful makeout session. Who said straight A nerds can't snag the ladies? Did you see that? Chemistry is a pretty standard rhythm based game. Make sure you study up on your controller buttons for this one. Press the correct buttons with the right timing, and you'll titrate with these. Good work! You get three chances each class, and the buttons don't change. So jot them down if you fail once. James, keep your mind on- You'll get a chemistry set for passing, which can be used to make firecrackers, stink bombs, and itching powder. Shop is similar, but requires button mashing and analog stick rotating instead of simple timed pushes. Oh, you screwed up there, son. Beating each successive shop unlocks improved BMX bikes. English is Bully's version of the addictive, casual game text twist. Finding as many words as possible from a jumble in a limited time frame might seem difficult, but some real cheating makes it a breeze. Exit the game with the triangle button and search for words at your leisure. Pass English classes to make your taunts and apologies more effective. How come you're such a dimwit anyways? Too bad apologizing is for suckers. Gym class is home to an awkward combination of homoerotic wrestling matches and dodgeball. In dodgeball, you'll make short you work of the jocks if you jump in a spiked ball close to the line. Also, if you see that you're losing grip of the ball, bring up the help menu with L1 to reset it. Who's on top? Wrestling class is a simple matter of following instructions. Beating wrestling will score you new combat moves and combos, while dodgeball will improve your weapon's accuracy. Oh, yeah! Photography classes are simple exercises in point-and-click artistry. And passing gets you lame prizes like color pictures and a photo album, but beating them all will get you double the tickets at carnival games. Oh, and the teach is hot. I'll miss these afternoons we've spent together. With incentives like that, you may be tempted to just fail a few classes in a row. If you do, you'll get this oh-so-fashionable dunce cap and unlock the timeout minigame. If real school had been like this, I totally would have gotten a degree in rhythm-based drafting. This order of cheat is available to go. Just visit g4tv.com slash podcast. We'll face bullies level bosses after the break, but first, here's a quick cheat to earn some extra cash. There's plenty of opportunity to make some dough at Bullworth. There are seemingly endless errands to run for the helpless people of Bullworth. 
These range from freelance crab collecting to recreational vandalism to helping a kindly hobo find his lost loot. Hey kid, want to help me find my lost medication? Okay, but only if you promise not to hurt yourself, Mr. McCombless Man, and you pay in cash. You can also mow lawns, deliver newspapers, and play keep-ups, the jock version of Hacky Sack. Also, don't forget to bet on the midget wrestlers, both entertaining and lucrative. I'm Alice Cooper, and you're watching G4 TV for gamers. Time Splitters 2 is awesome. A brilliant game. Xbox Nation Hail's first Halo. Now this. Experience a definitive PS2 shooter. Selected as a Game of the Year title. Time Splitters 2, the most acclaimed game of 2002. Available now. Rated T for Teen. I was looking at different uh, Zelda websites and he had one running, so I thought I'd email him. And he's like, well, if you're interested in Zelda, that's cool. I'm glad you like my website. And would you like to come down and visit? Would you like to go to E3? And I thought, well, E3 is great because it promotes uh, video games and that kind of thing. So we went last year and that's when we met. And it's really interesting because we started this whole friendship through video games, essentially. Without it, we wouldn't have known each other. Welcome back to Cheat's All Bully Edition. So far, you've seen Jimmy Hopkins hold his own against townies, teachers, and fellow students. But how does he stand up to a whole clique? Stronghold Assault is one of Bully's more difficult we'll missions. You into our In an attempt to seize control of Bullworth's nerd clan, you must storm the nerd castle and dethrone the nerd king. This guy may make it look easy. Peace, stain! But it's actually quite a challenge. With a few simple tricks, however, you'll have those nerds mining World of Warcraft gold for you in no time. First, ask the nerds about Ernest's whereabouts and the key code to the observatory. And when I say ask, I mean pummel the information out of them. After you beat the pocket protectors off these kids, it's time to run the nerd gauntlet. Here, you'll be repeatedly attacked by firecracker launching dweebs. It may be tempting to just barrel through, but I have some better advice. Your slingshot has longer range than their launchers, and you can take each nerd out from a safe distance. All it takes are two fully charged wrist rockets. Down the nerds on your way to the observatory, and you can fuel up on the pop they drop. Things get a bit trickier once you get to the Nerd King and his automatic potato gun. You have two options here. Work your way beneath the gate by strategically hiding behind the pillars, or take the easy way out and station yourself behind the wall of the canyon. You'll be out of the range of the gun in both of these spots, and you can take your sweet time to target and destroy the Transformer. Once the Transformer bites the dust, the nerds will retreat into Nerd Castle. This is your chance to jump on the potato cannon and wail on the doors. Nerds will pop up to shoot you from windows, but it's okay to ignore them and concentrate on the doors. If you lose too much health, hop back to ground level for some soda. Keep shooting until the gates fall. Inside, you'll discover the terrible secret of the observatory. Ernest, the nerd leader. My brain's against your brawn. Welcome to hell, Jimmy Hopkins! Ernest launches a three-part attack. First, he'll shoot you with the spud cannon. Hide behind the pillar on the front right side and destroy the two panels next to him with three shots from the slingshot. Next, he'll rain explosives on you. Go to the outer left side of the arena to escape the blast radius and pick off the second panel without getting shrapnel lodged in your side. Lastly, he'll return to the spud cannon. This time, you can stand behind the farthest pillar to the right for a clear shot. Keep plugging away. Ernest will fall eventually. To the Conqueror, go to the spoils, and you'll be rocking the kick-ass spud gun for the rest of the game. What better way to overthrow an anachronistic greaser gang than to fight your way through a good old-fashioned rumble? The rumble begins in New Coventry, where Lola lets on that she knows Jimmy Hopkins' secret. I'm Helen of Troy, and you're more interested in boys called Troy! Gangsters like Jimmy may not respond well to blackmail, but he'll have to satisfy this girl to continue on the road to complete bully domination. Start off by chasing Peanut into an alley. Sporting the name of a delicious snack might seem like a sign of weakness, but Peanut and his boys are actually pretty tough. 
You can conserve life by using ranged attacks and staying out of reach of their beefy fists. Get back here! Beating Peanut and his accomplices activates a fairly simple chase sequence. Just keep mashing the X button. Things get a bit stickier in the greaser arena. Ignore Johnny and move around the perimeter of the ring, targeting each of the six snipers with your slingshot. It only takes a shot or two before they fall. Move continuously or Johnny will be able to swipe at you from his bike and take a chunk of your health. If you get hit a few too many times, destroy a box on the periphery for some help. When all of the snipers are taken care of, loyal Petey will run to the magnet and take care of Johnny's ride and lead pipe. Now it's just you, Johnny, and some good old-fashioned mano a mano. Use the usual combos to finish him off and humiliate him. I give up. You can have her. Congratulations. You You've about, successfully Johnny? thwarted Follow suspicions and made the Greaser sure. King your slave. Now, only the jocks stand in the way of complete yourself. domination. What? You don't want her? Then why did you do this? Gee, a closet case who fights dirty? I think young Jimmy Hopkins is Ivy League material. We'll hit the road with Bully's various vehicles after the break. But first, food fight! It may seem like the clock is a harsh mistress, but Bully actually gives you plenty of opportunity to just wreak havoc. You can pick lockers and tag to your heart's content. If you feel like experiencing that old high school cliche that never really happens, head to the cafeteria to start a food fight. Oh yeah, we'll take this! All you have to do to unleash total mayhem is fling a piece of fruit in someone's direction. Easy as pie. Bully gives you the ability to create the ruckus you never had the cojones to do in high school. Just don't hit a girl. That's apparently an unforgivable offense and an instant bust. Unless you have a lawn mowing fetish. In which case, feel free to slap a lady. Video games of all time? Bushido Blade. Wishing! <laughs> hey, and you got a favorite video game character of all time? Super Metroid, man. When she dies, you can see her butt naked. <laughs> <laughs> Now that Jimmy Hopkins rules the school and bully, it's time to broaden his horizons. And to do that, he'll need some wheels. The most efficient form of transportation at Bullworth Academy is the school bus. But to get around in style, you're gonna need something a little more pimp than that, like a Vespa. Bully's condensed GTA universe is refreshing and quaint, but what kind of bully are you if you can't jack cars? Controls for the skateboard are unruly at best, and you'll waste a lot of time rolling around town tripping on stairs. The bike is only a slightly better alternative. To get the best BMX, you'll have to do the degrading work of actually attending class, and we all know what happens to teacher's pets. That was so cruel. Luckily, there are a few alternatives with actual motors in the bully universe. First off, head to the local carnival. Carney games are for more than just impressing the ladies. Collect 70 tickets to buy the snazzy European scooter from the prize booth. Here's a guide to beating the games with the minimum amount of effort. 
By far, the easiest of the games is High Striker. This game makes attaining the scooter just a few frenzied button-mashing sessions away. Press the X button quickly to reach the bell at the top and win six tickets. All the carny with your baseball skills at strikeout. Simply wait at the opposite side from where the targets arrive and press X when the target before the catcher scrolls over your marker. The shooting range is a classic game of target practice. Be sure to get the sheriff's star that appears halfway through the game to score major points. Splish Splash is as easy as sinking a surly midget. Wait for the marker to move over the red bullseye rather than trying to guide it there yourself. Oh, no! I already had my bath this year. And that's how you earn the ducats you need for that spiffy ride. Forget the old banana boat. Now you can cruise around the ville with some real style. Visit the carnival's go-kart races for another vehicular option. Defeating the five races unlocks the go-kart street heats that can be found around Bullworth. Carefully apply your power slides on tight corners and you'll win them handily. Place first in the three street races and you'll unlock the go-kart, by far the speediest whip around. Okay, there are more pimpin' rides, but that squat little speed demon beats the school bus any day. Of course, once you get around town, you'll meet some tougher customers than those wimpy high school gangs. Here's how to deal with the off-campus bosses. If storming a hobo enclave sounds like a good plan for Saturday night, then you're in luck. The Tenements is another of Bully's thorny missions. Now, you're tasked to retrieve the possessions of the local high-maintenance trollop, Lola. I'm a nice girl. I'm nice to everyone. Now, everyone hates me. <laughs> no kidding. Begin the great laundry quest by entering the tenement window. Once you're in, you'll be assaulted by a few surly grease balls. Be sure to take them out one at a time as they leave life-refreshing soda behind. Three of Lola's items, the address book, bag, and lipstick, can be I'll easily found among the detritus. You'll have to face Norton, the fearsome mini-boss, to score the last two items. You'll find Norton when you've worked your way up to the third story of the building. Whoa, whoa, what are you doing here? Um, uh, taking out the trash. <laughs> the key to defeating Norton is keeping your distance. His sledgehammer has a pretty impressive reach and inflicts heavy damage, so it's important to stay clear. Target Norton with the L1 button and circle around him, keeping clear of the trash on the floor. Resist temptation to rush in and punch him when he slumps. He'll recover with plenty of time to take a chunk out of your health. Pelt him with patience and he'll fall sooner or later. Now you can pick up one of the most satisfying tools in the game, the sledgehammer. Unfortunately, you only get to smash tenement walls searching for the rest of Lola's booty. And Why you can't take the away? sledgehammer with you. You'll just have to settle for this little ego boost from Lola. Wow, Jimmy, you're so manly. Edgar the townie isn't the last boss and bully, but he happens to be the hardest. You'll reach him after a long series of pulling switches, activating gates, and kick him butt with the help of your well-endowed sidekick, Zoe. I don't think I can beat all of them. Hang on, Jimmy. You'll see. Girl, hey, baby. you are one cool glass of lemonade. Once you've worked your way to Edgar, the real fight begins. Edgar comes equipped with his very own industrial-sized concussion creator, and all you get is a lousy old shield. Block his attacks with L1 and hit him with the shield when he tires. If your shield breaks, you can always grab another one off the wall. Careful, though. This can be a tricky move with Edgar on your tail. Wear his health down about a third of the way, and he'll head downstairs. Now you can pick up his forgotten pipe and follow him down. Here's where you bust out this nearly unbeatable series of moves. Press L1 to block with the pipe and wait until Edgar has finished his attack. Then move back a few steps and take some swings at him, quickly returning to a defensive posture. You'll have him writhing on the ground before he even gets in a single lick. Who knew subjugation could be so much fun? You had enough? You want some more? Come on, big guy. And that's it. Class dismissed. If you missed any of these tips, visit us on the web at g4tv.com slash cheat. You can also write to us at cheat at g4tv.com. Until next time, I'm Kristen Holt, and you've been cheating. Is your holiday just not performing? Then get G4's Holiday Joy! Now with Christmas Day Marathon! 15 hours of G4's biggest events and specials of the year, starting at 11 a.m.
This thing is going off. Watch out, incoming! It's awesome. It'll make you feel all tingly and jingly. Ah! Got it? Good. Now move it. The Holiday Joy Christmas Day Marathon starts Christmas Day at 11 a.m. You're not gonna live. It will be painful. You're doomed. Doom 3, rated M for Mature. Now on Xbox. She's not really hardcore or anything, but she likes playing them and stuff. I was lucky in that aspect. So, you know, you get a, a girl and then you drop 50 bucks on the game and she's like, well, how come we not going out? You know, what's this McDonald's garbage you taking me to? You know, and you sit there playing, well, I gotta play Metal Gear. And she's like, this is stupid. I'm bored, I wanna go somewhere. So I was lucky in the fact that she could sit there and watch Final Fantasy X for like three hours and not say nothing. It's good to face your fears together. It's good to turn a haunted house into a haunted pile of rubble together. Ah! It's good to see what happens when good kids go bad together. <laughs> Grab by the ghoulies from Rare to make us a Donkey Kong country. Ready to eat for everyone. It's good to play together. Right, Oli, my friend, here's your goods. Should have given those Soul Calibur fighters a right stick. But that sword you're using, pardon my pun, ain't gonna cut it, mate. Toss that dodgy dagger and take hold of this. The wait's over. Soul Calibur 2 finally puts the weapons back in your hands, featuring classic Soul Calibur fighters, new warriors, and over 10 modes of play. And exclusively on the Nintendo GameCube, Link joins the fun. How about off price? Soul Calibur 2, rated T for Teen. like being visited by a badass video game goddess who's way into anime and tight circuit laced apparel. Plus, she has a knack for digging up funny, obscure videos, and she can quote word for word from classics, like Old School and The Big Lebowski. That dude abides. Like G4, she is obsessed with high-tech gadgetry, out there blogs, and opinionated podcasts. She will take you to the sorts of far-off worlds where Master Chief and Transformers rule the landscapes. This energy-clad goddess slash sensei of digital goodness is plugged into what's going on. And therefore, my man, so are you. G4 is like that. You know, basically. Hey, welcome to Judgment Day. We're ringside because we're going to be talking about Rocky Boxing. I want you to hit that bag a hundred times! 
and someone's excited. Also on today's episode of Judgment Day is Wax for the Xbox, ATV Off-Road Fury 2 for the PlayStation 2, The Simpsons Skateboarding, and I get to review Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance. First game we're talking about today, and it's a fitting game, is going to be Rocky, the boxing game. You are so excited, man. I tell you. You've been I, waiting for this game for a long time. Well, I mean, you know, Rocky, of course, came out on the ColecoVision, if you remember that game. Right, so Rocky since boxing. the ColecoVision, you've been sitting in front of your TV. <laughs> waiting for, for the Rocky boxing game. The great thing about this game is that it follows all of the movies pretty darn well to a T. And trust me, I know a lot of detail. I can literally recite every single line to every single Rocky movie. It's really amazing to see all those characters, those cool Rocky characters fleshed out in a video game. You got Ivan Draco. I must break you. You got Clubber Lang. Mm, I pity the fool. We got that. I'm gonna get you. That ball. You a bet. You got Mickey, the uh, trainers in there. Yeah, I got Eat lightning and you're a crap thunder. It's very good. And of course, Rocky's in there, but they've got all the versions of you Rocky. You forgot about Apollo Creed. Oh, Apollo, Apollo Creed. Creed's greatest. Right. I'm the king of skiing, the master disaster. Rocky Balboa versus Apollo Creed. Sounds like a damn monster movie. If you're a fan of Rocky, you're going to have a ton of fun. They got all of the corner men from all the movies. The, the, the amazing thing is all of the environments as well. Like in the very first opening of the first Rocky movie, it pans down in yeah. that church and he's fighting Spider Rico. All that stuff is in the game. How about the crowds? The crowds oh, the actually crowds are hilarious. throw bottles and cans into the ring and, and, and bust them up. Now I gotta say that the graphics in this game are not great, especially on the Xbox. Yeah, some of the character modelings a little bit I thought were a little weird and they kind of got that plasticky yeah. uh, gloss. like they look. Some of the animations like, too, like when, yeah. when Rocky's punching low, he kind of looks a little sort of like a robot. But that isn't really what this game's about. The game is about sort of capturing the essence of the movies and keeping in style with the films, which were over the top. Boxing isn't like the Rocky movies. So you get a very arcadey, very fast action, very rewarding game because there's tons of fighters to win. There's new training modes that open up. It's very addictive, very fun game. I was very impressed with this one. Hey, yo, Vic, what'd you think of like the training mode, you know? I like the training modes, Rock. I mean, the, the, I, I had a lot of fun with the skipping rope. They got, you know, punching the handbags. And it's all the people from the movie as well. You do the sit-ups and just like in the movie when he puh, puh. And what they did is they grabbed the original Bill Conti Rocky tune, the Gonna Fly Now tune. Yeah. But I would have loved to have seen all of the Rocky music in there. They have a knockout tournament mode where up to 16 boxers can all kind of go against each other and you knock each other out and go to see who is the king of all fighters. They have over 30 boxers in the game now. But the they problem is everybody plays Rocky. If you love Rocky, you're going to freak for this game. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. I was surprised by how much I enjoyed myself. Hey, yo, I'm, uh, I'm going to give it like an 8.5, you know? On the positives, you got like, you have all these cool training things that like I do in the movies, you know what I'm saying? And then you also got all of the different arenas and and stuff, but the best thing is like the characters, you know? Now on the negative side, you know, the character modeling could have been a lot better! Where's all the great Rocky music for crying out loud, Rock? We need good music! All the music from the movie! And finally, besides some of the animations being better, we want Thunder Lips! Well, I'm glad that one's over. We're gonna move from Rocky Box into a whole other kind of fighting game. This, is, this one's called Whacked, and it's actually Xbox Live compatible. Why is this Xbox Live compatible? I think the only thing I can think of is Microsoft wanted a very easy game for players to jump into. The presentation, they have some kind of cute, funny, tongue-in-cheek kind of humor stuff that's yeah. like, you know, almost kind of funny and everything. Hey, you think you're evil? Well, you should try reading some of these books, like Kittens Make Great Jackets, Son of One Part Two, No Mommy, Not the Clown Suit, and Why You'll Be Alone Forever, 
Well, what they've got, it's, it's set up like a game show. You got this guy named Fantastic, and he's got this ridiculous hairdo, and he comes up and he... He's you know, all hairdo. Yeah, they, they've, come up with some pretty, they've come up with some pretty funny lines and for him. Yeah, they've come up with some pretty funny lines for the guy, and there's a bunch of other car crazy cartoon characters. Well, my favorite's Lucy, right. who is in this really skin-tight outfit in the very beginning of the game, right. and then it just busts out, there's boobies everywhere, and they actually censor the thing with like a bar bars. Yeah. throughout the whole game. That's so right. So she plays the game entirely naked. With censor bars. And, th and that's always fun. I liked Eugene, the, the penguin. I think that guy was pretty cool. But the problem is, is that overall, this game is just very, very lackluster and, and, and poor, to be well, honest Well, what it is, it's a, it's a collection of mini games. And you basically, you open up curtains and doors and you walk into Barely. different rooms. Basically, all you're doing is running around in 3D and you're either playing a King of the Hill match where you're trying to take over a territory for a certain amount of time, or you're collecting things for a certain amount of time, or you're trying to kill people for a certain amount of time. The environments that these challenges take place in are very, very small. And the control for getting around in these rooms is ridiculous. It's one of those spin the whole world around type games. You don't have any kind of like physical sort of connection to your character. Every time you spin, to turn somewhere else, the whole world spins with you. You have to get nauseous. It's really ridiculous. The other thing, too, is that they have some cool elements within the environments. Like, there's this one big red button that will pop up. Right. If you go and knock on it, it does weird things. Like, it'll flip the whole environment upside down, or it will reverse the other player's controls. And they also have question marks, and the question marks will affect the other players, or it affects you, like you'll you'll b turn on fire, and then you have to go around trying to touch people to light them on fire. Which is all kind of nice. It would have been a lot better if you actually could see these characters better and you felt more connected to them. They don't have any animations of them holding the different weapons that you can pick up. You just get this giant floating weapon beside them. And then you got to deal with this whole world turning issue. And the gameplay elements in there are so repetitive and so boring ah. and get so tiring so quickly, this game is a complete waste of time. It's it, whacked. It's a, it totally is whacked. And what's really telling is that there aren't very many Xbox Live games to play out there right now. But if you go online to play whacked, you're going to have a very tough time finding rooms with people in them. It's not many characters in the game, yeah, you know, But the, what they built there is kind of nice. I wish they had extended that out a little bit more and actually got you, the players more involved with, with these characters and with what they could do, you know? And instead, it's just a... Uh, it's it, whacked! It, so I'm giving this game 2 out of 10. I'm giving it a 3.5. I like the naked girls. On the positive side, some of the humor and characters in the game are kind of funny. It is Xbox Live compatible, and some of the ways you can torture your opponents was pretty good as well. On the negative side, this game features poor graphics, poor control, and poor level design. The online play would be fun if people were actually playing online. Really, this game has no replay value whatsoever. You've seen it all within 10 minutes, and you just won't care. Stick around, there's lots more for us to fight about. We're going to be taking a look at The Simpsons Skateboarding after this. I want you to drop down and give me 20! That gets better every time. <laughs> Devil May Cry 2, rated mature, only from Capcom. Let's rock, baby. Hey. hey, how's it going? I'm just getting all prepped up for some deep space solar exploration in Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance, which I've got right here. This game is incredible. Nintendo's done it again. This is going back to the good old days of Metroid. It's all side-scrolling fun. There's lots of cool bad guys to take care of. Tons of really awesome boss battles. It's, you know, it's the same old kind of gameplay where you, you roll up into a ball 
where you drop all the little bombs. There's lots of little secret areas to find. There's all kinds of cool power-ups that you can pick up along the way. In this game, Samus actually has an opponent that looks exactly like her. Her opponent's got the same kind of abilities as Samus does. It's very tough. She goes around busting down all kinds of tunnels that you can't get back through again. So, like every good Metroid game, you've got to find your way through the game, find all the secret areas, find the tunnels, get the power-ups, save your way along the way, because there's a lot of game in here, and there's lots of stuff to find in Metroid Fusion. But I think one of the best things about this game is that it actually hooks up with Metroid Prime for the GameCube. This is Metroid Heaven. We've been waiting a long time for this game, and Nintendo delivered on all counts. The graphics are awesome, the sound effects are awesome, the music is really cool and spooky and moody. I love all the parallax scrolling, I love the enemies, I love the weapons. This is a great game. 9.5 Metroid Fusion must buy. All right, we're back. We're getting our legs in shape because we're talking about a skateboarding game, but not just any skateboarding. Don't you hate people who walk like this? I sure, street? I sure do. We're talking about the Simpsons skateboarding. Oh yeah, for the PlayStation Two from EA. You didn't like it? Oh, oh my God. Well, it's from Fox Interactive and EA. Right. Uh, I don't know what happened with this game. Are the Simpsons games cursed? Do this, you think? Well, the Simpsons. Do you think they'll games, ever make a good one? The Simpsons games are like the Army Men games. They'll never be good. Right. They never were good. Right. And this one is absolutely. No exception. Well, you're entering into dangerous territory when you're trying to take on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I think you should be. You're, you're barely moving here. I'm comfortable. I, I, I really think. No, we, I. I we I'm, need some I, of that I'm, going I'm, on that's, there. Okay, now we I'm going to. I'm going to be out of breath. As far as the engine's concerned, right? You know, it, there was a lot of load times. The frame rate on the game, everything was so choppy. I mean, hey, this is a skateboard game, so you got to compare it to your Tony Hawk. You do have fours. to compare it to the, and, and it doesn't and compare. Other, it uh, doesn't stack up to that. Absolutely. I, I was actually close. surprised. I mean, not this is th close. this is pretty gutsy to bring this to market and pit it against games like Tony Hawk. I mean, I oh. think that's. That's I mean, pretty crazy because you're going to compare the things and it, it doesn't stack up. Technically, I, I wasn't that horrified by the game. I mean, you do get to pull, pull uh, off tricks. There, you know, you, you can get to control, pull off tricks. So you what? can control the characters. You can get them doing some of the zany moves. The camera isn't as tight as it is on the Tony Hawk oh, style games. Oh, Lord, the, the, the camera tricks aren't as cool. Is one of the biggest problems in the game. I mean, you slam into walls and you get stuck on corners, and it almost the goes into like. The collision detection is terrible. And it almost goes into yeah. first person mode. All you see is. Bart's big head, and you, I mean, it's, yeah. it's absolutely the frame rate on the game is is poor. They actually put some some texturing and coloring on some of the environments and stuff now, and you get all kinds of traffic and stuff whizzing by. It's not like it's a big empty area or anything like that. The stunts that they have in the game aren't really that good. The voiceovers, although were created yeah. for the game, that's right, are With extremely the, repetitive. They are repetitive, and not but very are, they funny. are the voices from the show. Nose grab. Man. Bring in the copter. Nice 50 50 grind. Oh man, that's sand. The idea is kind of cool. That's all right. I think that the uh, idea uh, of having what, the Simpsons a skateboarding on game? skateboards. Well, in, in the same way that having Spider Man. I think, I, think, I think you need to be going no, faster. No, no, no. Okay, enough with that. I think it's in the same way that Spider Man was a playable character in Tony Hawk. This would have been perfect for them to put Bart Simpson into a Tony Hawk game. That's where they should have gone with this. Don't try to take no. Tony Hawk at his own game. If you're not going to come with a good game, it's not even worth our time. Bart Simpson, for the most part, and Lisa, and a lot of these characters are kind of like smaller characters. Right, right. They're not like tall, lanky people that can really grab on. So you really don't get the sense that you're doing all these fancy it's pretty, tricks. It's pretty this. bizarre to watch Marge with her six-foot hairdo <laughs> doing uh, uh, grabs and, and fakies and all Look, these and the stuff like that. Look, the bottom line is that this game should have never been done. I'm giving it a three. A three out of ten. And that's being nice. Uh, I'm going to give it a 3.5. On the positive side, for fans of The Simpsons, the game does feature voiceovers from the actual actors on the show. All the characters are in there, although it's a little bit strange to be skateboarding with Marge. And although this game doesn't come anywhere close to a Tony Hawk, the environments are actually quite lively. On the negative side, the frame rate isn't very good. The game isn't fun to play at all. There's long loading times, and the camera angles are not well done. Now we've talked about 5.1 technology for your PC before with the Altic Lansing speakers. But what you need to do and run something like that 
is a 5.1 enabled sound card. And what we're taking a look at today is actually a 6.1 sound card from Hercules. It's called the Game Theater XP. It's a regular sound card that slaps in your PC into a PCI slot. Yeah. And then from there, you get this big honking cable that right. connects to this outboard hub. Hey. And you can plug in all kinds of stuff, all well, kinds of USB stuff. And it's got the gold-plated jacks, you know, for the RCA. Right. It also has two digital spadiff ends. You can plug in a MIDI connection, you can plug in microphone, headphones. Got your quarter inch for your headphones, not the little eighth inch plug. It keeps everything nice, neat, and organized right. on top of your PC. In my computer, I have like everything hooked up in the back, so I have to change something or add something right. new. You gotta take your computer out and this and that. I hate that. And this. for gamers who are always plugging in controllers and stuff like that, it's a total nightmare. So this thing, it adds all of the 6.1 functionality and you can actually get 6.1 positional audio. So it's right. actually seven speakers. It's completely compatible all over the place. And the audio quality is think excellent. You speed up a little bit. If I speed up, I can't keep my head straight. Just a little bit. All right, okay. Now, what's the price on this thing? About one hundred and twenty dollars for the for the whole bucks. package. I totally recommend the Hercules Game Theater XP. I recommend it as well. On the positive side, this device has tons of great inputs and outputs. Besides audio inputs, it also has the powered USB inputs, so you can plug in things like joysticks. And finally, it has a separate unit to connect all this stuff to so you don't have to get behind your PC every two seconds when you want to change stuff. On the negative side, you're going to have to go and get seven speakers for your PC now. And 120 bucks, although is a good deal for this unit, that's quite a bit of money. We'll be right back with a look at ATV Off-Road Fury 2 for the PlayStation 2. It's pretty good, man. 40 miles an hour. Hi, I'm Dean Kane. You're watching G4 now. Take out those ATSTs. You heard the commander. Let's take care of those ATSTs. I've got a little bit of a dilemma for you. How do you go up against a powerhouse like Tony Hawk's Pro Skateboarder? It's pretty hard, and I think everybody that's tried has had a lot of difficulty with it, including this game. This one's called Grind Session. It was published by Sony First Party for the PlayStation 1. It's a little bit different than Tony Hawk. It shares some similarities, obviously. It's another skateboarding game. Uh, there's some real-life skate parks in there that are based in Atlanta and London and Vancouver and San Francisco and Huntington Beach. There's real-life pros in here. My favorite one is Pigpen. Anyways, you've got all kinds of really cool style and moves that you can pull off. There's lots of like ridiculously unrealistic 360 air combo spin or ammo whoop de doo kind of deals that you can do and land and you look like a god, but you couldn't ever do in real life. There's lots of those kinds of moves in here. But what I thought was really interesting is that the engine was very solid and it was very fun to get up on the gr I mean, the grinding is a really big deal in here. And grinding throughout the game is a lot of fun and very easy. And comboing and linking up the tricks actually work quite well. This one's called Grind Session. It's Sony First Party for the PlayStation 1. Go check it out. All right, we're back and we're talking about ATV Off-Road oh. Fury 2 for the PlayStation 2. Do you need a, do you need a hand? I need to. Turn around this way. All right, turn around this way. OK, all right, slow down. Slow down. You're only supposed to do what you're capable of. What do you think of this game for the PlayStation 2? This game was done by Rainbow Studios. That's right. And Ra Rainbow Studios were the guys who did Splashdown. Right. right. The controls for me were almost too impossible. There was no, you know, like in Splashdown, there was some give and you had to use the thing to turn. And, yeah. and this game is just like, you know, there's a, a really tight hairpin turn. It's just like, and you just take it. It wasn't kind of took a little bit of the challenge away. From it's very it. forgiving, but that's part of the learning process in the game. As you get into more challenging tracks and faster ATVs, it becomes much, much trickier to make those corners. 
I was a big fan of the first ATV. I thought it was a total sleeper hit. It came out of nowhere. Here we have the sequel, and they've improved the graphics. Yes. They've given you more ATVs. They've given For you sure. better, better riders, more gear, and this thing is playable online. Yeah, I mean, you know. How the, cool is that? Well, the, the thing, though, is that in the single-player game, you know, the, the AI of the, the bikes, you know, they all kind of really, you know, kind of, they they're always together, yeah, they and they're cluster. always cluster, and when you pass them, they'll always, you make one little mistake, and they pass you. I mean, the trick, take it, teach it, would you stop? Maybe, maybe maybe you shouldn't exercise right now. The trick system is is, is a little different too because in in Splashdown, you know, you you'd press the R1 or the you know L2, L, all the top shoulder buttons. Yes. And then you did the trick. In this, you have it's, to press like the. It's controller, config, and buttons at the yeah, same time. Yeah, and I, you know I didn't like that. And the other thing is, you never really got the big air. No, that's absolutely to get, untrue. To get the big awesome tricks, it's no, always, you it's always tough. To do the you, tricks. You don't do the tricks during the racing as much as, much as you do yeah. in Splashdown. Be but the freestyle modes and the stunt modes are amazing in this game. You get tons of air and you can combo tricks together. One of the cool things about ATV Off-Road 2 as well is the fact that they've included all kinds of mini games in there. You can play cool things like ATV hockey. Here's the bummer about that though. Those are the most fun kind of multiplayer mini games to play. Yeah but they don't give those as an online right. option. Right. I like the fact that the music is, uh, it, it's all very aggressive. It's all meant to sort of get you juiced up for the race. Some of the music is hip hop. Yes. And then some of the music is like metal. I like you it. Did, you know, why, why don't you just take like country and techno? And you know, it just, it doesn't make any sense. It's definitely the best quad game out there. It's awesome. But I just didn't have super casual, fragilistic fun with it. I love this game, but the fact that it, you can play it online and start having challenges with other people, amazing. This is a definite must-have for PlayStation 2 owners, especially if you have the network adapter, 9 out of 10. Wow, I give it a 7. On the positive side, the graphics are much improved over the first game. There's tons of great little mini-games in the game. But the best feature of all is that this game is online playable on the PlayStation 2. Incredible stuff. On the negative side, the computer-controlled players really just kind of stuck together the whole time. Didn't really feel like a realistic race. I thought that the trick system could have been done a lot better. And although some of the music is good, mixing hip-hop with metal tunes, eh. Today on Judgment Day, we took a look at Rocky for the Xbox. Now, it's great that all of the movie Rockies are actually in the game and unlockable, but the character modeling does look a little bit weird in this game. Also on the Xbox and compatible with Xbox Live is Whacked. It's great that this game is playable online. The trouble is, the game's so lame, you're probably going to have a tough time finding anyone else to play with. On the PlayStation 2, we looked at ATV Off-Road Fury 2. This game's a huge improvement over the first one, and you can play it online. How cool is that? Also on the PlayStation 2, we reviewed The Simpsons Skateboarding. Clever idea. Poor execution. And in hardware, Tommy and I looked at the Hercules Game Theater 6.1 XP. We like the fact that the sound card has an outboard box to connect everything into. Only problem is, now you gotta find seven speakers. On the Game Boy Advance, I reviewed Metroid Fusion. This is a terrific game. It is the 2D Metroid game we've been waiting forever for. Fantastic experience. Well, that's it for this show. We hope you guys have had fun watching Tommy try to exercise and not hurt himself. We'll see you guys next time on Judgment Day. You okay? You doing okay? Can't stop safe. it. Are you okay? Could you? Just, just take it easy. Slow it down. You're not supposed to lift more than what you're capable of. Are you all right? It's those six burritos you had for lunch, isn't it? Okay. All right, oh. he's back. <laughs> One more time. I want you to hit that bag a hundred times. It's up to you to decide who will achieve the Game of the Year award at G-Foria. The nominees are Metroid Prime, GTA Vice City, Tom Clancy Splinter Cell, Battlefield 1942, Animal Crossing.
Achieve enlightenment. Achieve the glow. g Foria, presented by EB Games and G. San Andreas, coming soon to Xbox. Rated M for Mature. My name is Wolf Morrow, and I'm the world record holder for the fastest time through the Tomb Raider 2 obstacle course. My family's been deeply involved in gaming since the late 70s. I started entering video game contests back when it was considered a geek's passion. My father and brother are avid gamers as well. They're both currently working on the fastest possible completion of The Legend of Zelda. Eventually, we ran out of ideas and couldn't get a time faster than 105.7. I was convinced I could do better. Using an approach similar to the late Bruce Lee's philosophy, I took only the most effective parts of each method or style I could find through extensive research on the internet. I then made a solution set of these techniques and started applying them to the game. It took me six hours of constant attempts before I could finally nail 103.9 on videotape. I never gave up until I got the record without any cheats. Gosh, that was my best time yet. This isn't an easy thing for me to say, so I'm just gonna say it. I've talked it over with Wood Elf and Tiger Woman, and we're going with another cleric. Sorry, Padre. Good luck finding health potions. Save Mario from the supernatural. <laughs> Luigi's Mansion. Only for Nintendo GameCube. Rated E for everyone. G4, let the games begin. Today on X-Play, Rockstar Games makes a western full of burning. Bleeding, fat, naked cowboys. <laughs> Plus, Elvin Booty in Lineage 2. And important questions in La Pazelle Tactics. What's with the bear suit? Ask him. It's game time. Less enthusiasm in Adam Zessler and Morgan Webb. Hi. Welcome to Next Play. On today's show, the people behind Grand Theft Auto make a Western game. Because the American frontier had hoes, too. It's true. Plus, a strategy RPG where you fight zombies and whales, so it's made expressly for people who hate alternative religious lifestyles and large marine mammals. Republicans. And let's not forget half-naked elf women, half-naked orc women, and me feeling very uncomfortable about Lineage 2. Plus, free downloadable content, bowling for your PS2, and a very special segment on the unique voices we found on Xbox Live. But we start the show with a look at the latest release from Rockstar Games. Yes, Rockstar is famous for releasing Grand Theft Auto, but they also put out subpar ultraviolet crapola like State of Emergency and Manhunt. So what's the new one like? Find out when we review Red Dead Revolver. Darling, 
Redhead Revolver has the traditional story we all know from the Old West. Boy has dad. Life has hope. Dad dies at the hands of mean, dusty people. Son squawks like a bird. Son exacts revenge on hordes and nefarious clown people. Just like High Noon, but without the majesty. You gonna blow up Red Dead Revolver is the second attempt this year to revive the non-existent genre of the Western game, which means we've already exhausted all the Western cliches. Oh wait, hold on. Here's the good. The game works. It's an action game that serves up ample action. Enemies are plentiful, and you have those fun old weapons that shoot slowly to take them down. And their heads squish like old-time melons. Since the Old West was overrun with craggy rocks and abandoned wheelbarrows, you can use these as cover, which helps keep the game from being just running and gunning. Keeping things even more authentic is the ability to slow down time and line up a series of shots on your enemies. For you kids who weren't around in these claim jumping opium and smoking days of yore, it's called Deadeye. Plus, I bet 50% of you duelers out there love a good duel. Well, rejoice, because in this game, you can shoot people who are standing around waiting to be shot. I still don't really understand how it works, but I win a lot. The nicest aspect of Red Dead Revolver is that it throws a lot of different scenarios at you, like shooting in an old place, shooting on a moving train, shooting at nighttime, shooting homicidal clowns in arid setting. Now, the bad. Enemies aren't smart. They just kind of come at you and you shoot them. Apparently, mean people in the West could take a frightening amount of damage before acknowledging death. Maybe it is all the opium, but I know it's so the game offers a challenge, but it does look funny. Fat people run faster than you. And don't tell me that's gravity. The camera also plays an unfortunate role. The player has full control over it, which sounds nice, but it moves like a handicapped bear in a tub of molasses. The areas you play in are typically small, and the camera's in tight. Enemies come at you from all sides, making it very difficult to know where trouble's at until someone shoots you. Maybe if they said, howdy, varmint, or something, that would help. Also, despite the attempt at variety, the gameplay loses its spark pretty quickly. Most challenges just involve shooting dusty people. And now, the ugly. While the game isn't as ugly as a baboon's ass, it does lack the color and curiosity of that particular primate's butt. Apparently, all game designers think that old things looked old even when they were new. And this lady scares me. Good day to you, stranger. Are those jowls, or did she paint a mustache on herself using cigar ash? The biggest regret about Red Dead Revolver is that it could have been great. It needed a lot more work, but as it is, it's playable, not enjoyable. A two out of five. So this game was originally developed by Capcom, who figured out it was probably going to suck. Then Rockstar picked it up, put some blood and naked clowns in it, and shipped the sucker out. You know, frankly, I'm surprised there isn't a chainsaw and a Dennis Hopper cameo in it. Now, the one bright point is the soundtrack, which could have been ripped from a Sergio Leone film. Moving on, we have a Japanese strategy RPG, so I'm going to leave the set now and read labels on cat food tins. It's just something to do. Come back. This was made by the makers of Disgaea. No, 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 it's no fancy feast. Mm. Just because Adam hates games with depth and substance doesn't mean you have to. Or do you? Anyway, this title has a cult following on the crescent-shaped island we call Nantucket. Sorry, I mean Japan. Anyway, here's our review of La Pucelle Tactics. Turn the fish. From the makers of Disgaea comes La Pucelle Tactics, a cute and cuddly strategy RPG about saving the world from evil spirits. Are you ready to exercise? Sorry. The game focuses on Prie, a teen demon hunter in training with a bit of an attitude. Why do I have to waste my time fighting zombies? They are such wimps! What if my clothes get dirty? They were just washed! Her sibling, Kulat, provides so ranged attacks and helpful tidbits of wisdom. We're new with this, so we've got to start small and then move on to tougher enemies. Helpful for people who have never played a video game before. Combat takes place on gridded battlegrounds covered in colored energy streams. Prie and her exorcist friends can purify the sources of the energy, sending a shockwave of damage-dealing goodness along the stream that can eliminate enemies in its path. 
Alternately, you can just go beat the crap out of enemies until they die. In a cool twist, purifying an enemy before defeating it can cause it to switch sides and join you. It isn't long before your army consists not only of strikingly dressed demon hunters, but also the very bats and zombies they're mowing down. Once you complete a map, you can go back and play it again, which leads to an interesting exploit in the game. By returning to a map over and over and repeatedly KOing your own allies, you can level your characters up to ridiculous levels before you've even completed the first dungeon. Alright! Can you just stop complaining for a while? Shut up, you! This is a double-edged sword. If you use this trick, the game will be pathetically easy. If you don't, Lapisel Tactics will chew you up and spit out the seeds. That's because this game is entirely based on numbers and stat levels, to the point that the tactics part can become irrelevant. The real strategy in La Pucelle is in finding the best ways to make your characters insanely powerful, and using the puzzle-like purification system to kill multiple enemies and fuse normal items into monster-terrorizing uber-weapons. The game doesn't require this approach, but it certainly favors it. If you're stifling maniacal laughter at this point, this is your kind of game. There's also a decent story mixed in here that ranges from the modeling. We lost our parents seven years ago. They died in a carriage accident coming back from work. To the ridiculous. What's with the bear suit? If you're a stat-maxing, power-leveling, anime-watching RPG fan, congratulations! A target audience is you! If your core isn't quite so hard, you may want to look elsewhere. Can you just stop complaining for a while? We give it a three out of five. You suck! With a name like La Pucelle, you'd think it was a French game. This is when Adam would usually say something kind of funny. Probably about baguettes or a joke about Charles de Gaulle that only one person in the audience would get. I bet that one person really misses him right now. For everyone else, after the break, we have Naked Elves. I don't know why you people like that, but you do. Up next, setting the women's movement back 20 years, it's Lineage 2. Woo! What the hell is going on? Ninja Gaiden will probably be the tightest action video game in terms of control mechanics and depth of control, depth of action. The Ninja Gaiden is definitely the game I'm most excited about for the Xbox this year. I think it's probably the best 3D action game this fall. Tune in to G4's Holiday Hit List all this month. It doesn't matter if you run or where you hide. I will hunt you. I will find you. I am the Hitman. Hitman 2, available now. Rated M for Mature. Stealing your soul since 2003, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. We keep your souls in a box, along with a couple of preview copies of Halo 2. Yes, welcome back to X-Play. Yes, we have a massively multiplayer online game. Yes, it has dark elves. Yes, the elves are pretty much naked. Yes, they made me review it. Here's Lineage 2 for the PC. Ah. Welcome to the beautiful world of the MMORPG Lineage 2. Let's find out who we're going to be today. I'm into the Dark Elves because they use black magic. Though, those can't be real. They don't even jiggle. They sure are perky. Hmm, they do jiggle more when she runs. But I think it's safe to say they're totally fake. Uh. There's some elf surgeon out there doing a good business. Okay, I'm really sick of looking at her butt. So let's try, ooh, this burly orc woman. Urgh, I am so tough. Urgh, people will cower before me. Ah! My god, I'm looking at her butt too. 
I am not gonna sit here all day and stare at her thong. I have a recommendation for the graphic artists. Stop watching so much porn! I'm gonna play as this dwarf girl. I'm sure she's just an addition for the pedophiles, but at least you can't see her butt. Now, don't get me wrong, the art is so beautiful, but the limited choices for character body type are as annoying as the running style of the elves. But now that I have my cute dwarf lady, I'm gonna set out on my adventure. Ah, I'm stuck in the floor. Get me out of here. Maybe I'll just run to a flat part. You start out with little tasks, like go get the groceries for the dwarf man, but mainly you'll be killing 27,000 of these poor little innocent raccoons for experience points. It's a little slower when, like my dwarf lady, you don't have magic. You kill one, then you sit down and recover health. Kill one, you sit, you kill one. Ooh, do you feel like a big man now? Killing a cute little bunny corn as it flees in terror? The thing that sets Linea apart is that you can kill other players and take their stuff. Hey, quit it, I'm just a noob. Of course, if you do this enough, other people won't like you very much and come after you. Ha, that's what you get, punk ass. Hey, thanks for saving me, nice man. Hey, hey, don't run away. What are you doing later? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a guy. If you don't have a psychopathic antisocial bent, Lineage 2 offers the standard MMORPG buffet of activities. But the game is so stingy in handing out cash and experience points that playing feels a little like running up the down escalator. You're going to invest a lot of time before you get to kill anything bigger than you. But I wouldn't know, because I still have about 180 more raccoons to kill. Why don't you guys take off? I'm gonna be here a while. A two out of five. Now, for some reason, MMORPG players really like scantily clad women, especially if they have horns or pointy ears. I don't know what that says about your relationships with your mothers, but you know, hey, that's between you and your mom. And what's between you and your computer, aside from a sneeze guard, are a lot of free downloads, like this one, from Neighbors from Hell 2. So while it might be nice to take a vacation, this one's going to be a nightmare. It seems that Mr. Cranky here has a problem. It's his neighbor, Woody. Woody has a reality TV show that revolves around, well, ruining his neighbor's good times. It's a journey of bear traps, soggy hats, electrocutions, and hopefully, high ratings. And who wouldn't want that? Interested parties should point their browsers over to the official Neighbors from Hell website. Here you can meet the assorted characters, peruse illustrations, and along the bottom panel, find a link to download a two-level playable demo. It's the Neighbors from Hell 2 Vacation Downloadable, and it's free to take a peek at. Just be sure Big Olga doesn't catch you looking. <laughs> yes, believe it or not, there are tons of free downloads on the internet. And only 90% are porn. I checked. Coming up, because even game designers run out of ideas, it's Strike Force Bowling! stuff go to the one place that has it all like spider-man the computer game there's something fun for everyone at best buy go get him spider-man yeah hello i'm tom sloper i designed the games in the game time watch this is the rare early yellow button version Know your history. G4, TV for gamers. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Wells. We're not that bad. Have you seen Nash Bridges? <laughs> 
Welcome back to X Play, the show that has the audacity to review a bowling game. Yes, and a continued effort to prove that we're totally open to new experiences that don't involve physical activity. We have a review of a dynamic new bowling game for the PS2. Dynamic. Sounds better than unnecessary. Here's a review of Strike Force Bowling. You know your gaming system has earned its stripes when bowling titles start appearing on shelves. Now it's not necessarily a precursor to the apocalypse, but rather a positive sign that mainstream sports are being adequately covered to the point where publishers are looking for something new to fill the void. That's a good thing of course, especially to those patiently holding out for versions of horseshoes, croquet and badminton. Strike Force Bowling is a budget release hoping to bowl over PS2 owners while trying to spare gamers from complicated controls and any hint of depth. The interface here, which involves timing button presses at specific intervals along the horizontal meters, couldn't be simpler. If it were any more basic, it would be hooked on phonics. Players can move their bowler left or right to set the ball's path indicated by a red line, like so. Spin is adjusted by moving a percentage marker up and down, which curiously has no effect on the line showing the ball's direction. After these two adjustments, it's time to bowl, which involves pressing a button twice. The first to set power, and the second to set accuracy. And that's that. So while the pin action seems realistic enough, there doesn't seem to be any noticeable effect of oil on the ball, and the lanes all appear to have the same amount of carry. Sadly, Strike Force Bowling looks like an early 3D computer title. Something you might have played back in the days of the old wood burning computers. There are only eight characters available. Two males, a few females, an alien, a robot, and one skeleton. The skeleton, ironically, shows up when you play skins rounds. The bowler moves stiffly and has the same awkward looking animations for reaction shots, like cheers, jumps, tantrums, and so forth. Which are fun to watch, like, what, twice maybe? Yeah, note I said maybe. Unfortunately, there's little difference between the lanes other than appearance. They did toss in a golf variation, but I don't know. I suppose it was meant to be cool. Anyway, well, gosh, that's about it. What you see is what you get. So since Strike Force Bowling doesn't have the depth or realism to satisfy bowling fans, nor does it have the visual flair off the gameplay to lure arcade sports junkies from their usual titles, you might end up with buyer's remorse. The game looks and feels every bit like its budget status, which might be okay if you adjust your expectations accordingly. For most players, however, Strike Force Bowling is the game equivalent of bowling shoes. Cheap, tacky, a little stinky, and something best left behind the rental counter. We can only afford it an underwhelming two out of five. Ah, yes, the ancient Egyptian art of bowling. Yeah. And for the pins, they use the sacred jars that contain the organs of their mummified friends. Mm, historical accuracy in games. We have to applaud it when we see it. Just like the scary clowns in Red Dead Revolver. I mean, those guys are how the West was really won. One terrifying child at a time. Oh Up God. next, yes, this is. Xbox Live user raises the level of discourse. Do you mind trying to make a love for your car? and wisdom of the fine art of online conversation. It came from Xbox Live. <laughs> go bang, go, yeah. I have carpal syndrome. I can't feel my fingers. They're turning blue. My eyes are bleeding. <laughs> I'm hot. Yes, you are, baby. Oh, it's all hot. Have you might try to make love to your car? I did it once. I, I just made out with it, man. That's all that was. There was nothing gay or anything. Hey, the, X the, the Xbox box is big enough to live in. You 
should hear the stuff we couldn't air. No, no, you shouldn't. The fact that there out there somewhere is a man who gives new meaning to the phrase auto erotica is terrifying enough. Yes, please, Xbox Live users, refrain from making love to your Honda Civic. That totally violates the warranty. Mm -hmm. Now we end tonight with an answer to one of your burning questions. What happened to Corey Hayden? That guy was great in the 80s. Actually, this is a technical question about video game design that many of you have asked. And since we aren't exactly programmers, we called in an expert to answer your question about MIP maps. MIP maps are scaled versions of a unique texture used in a rendered frame. As the distance between the viewpoint and a textured polygon increases, scaled down MIP maps are used to achieve a more realistic effect. Likewise, as the textured polygon's distance decreases with respect to the viewpoint, higher resolution MIP maps are used to increase the detail of a rendered object. MIP is short for the Latin phrase multimin parvo, which means many things in a small place. <laughs> It's all very clear to me now. Yes. Now, hey, if you're unclear on anything game-related, catch The Road to Gphoria, premiering this Friday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Time on G4 Tech TV. Gphoria, the award show for gamers, is presented by EB Games and G, and you can watch it later this week. And now, if you want some instant gratification now, you can always go to our website. Yes, go to our website. That's g4techtv.com slash... X-Play, that's the name of our show. Yes, that's very good, that's why it's there. And there you're gonna find some reviews of the games we've talked about this week. And video and stuff. Yeah, and there's some pictures and stuff and pictures, too. Pictures, pictures, I love pictures, you can learn a lot about yeah, that. So visuals. go there now and go go say stupid stuff on Xbox Live so we can tape it. And yes, it's more great to you love it. All right, you guys are great out there. <laughs> that's mine. We blew something out. Yeah, my uh, girlfriend gets upset when I'm playing it in the nighttime. People stay for hours in front of the TV. People will not uh, eat anything. They will not go to the bathroom unless he has to. Has to. Yeah. I've seen this guy. He's like 10 hours, man. He's still playing, playing it like, until like 2 o'clock. And it's like, like I gotta go to work. I'll save it here, and I, it would be an hour later until I'd save yeah. it. And then yeah, I wouldn't eat or anything. <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning, this guy's still up, man. If you can't beat them, eat them. Chew up the competition with Kirby as he jets across 20 gut-busting race courses in Kirby Air Ride. Only on Nintendo GameCube. Rated E for everyone. GameCube. Yeah, my brother-in-law, he's always inviting me over to watch his big, fancy TV. And you hate him for it. So you want something bigger and better for a lot less money. Yeah. At Circuit City, we have all the hottest new TVs, from HDTV to plasma, LCD, and more. And with unbeatable prices guaranteed, you'll find the perfect one. Circuit City. Ah, 
like the world needs you. The time is now. Let us team up. Let us power up. And maybe even blow up. And stink up. Power up to the people! Bad world. Munch's Odyssey. In a city where chaos rules, only one man can save humanity from total destruction. Hmm. Woohoo! It's up to Homer Simpson and family to save the world from a diabolical plot as they run and drive to unravel the conspiracy. Blackfinch! Critics call it the best what? Simpsons game ever. Get the lot, dudes. The Simpsons Hit and Run, rated T for Team. I am evil Homer. Faster than his meteoric rise to fame was his tragic fall from grace. Given a second chance at G4, Pokan takes his life off pause and gets back in the game. Yeah, he definitely has his bad days, you know, like when he forgets to eat and stuff. These young guys could learn a lot from this Pokan. He's a real pro. It was his game experience that really caught my eye. Well, that and the fact that he's Panda Bear. Tonight on X-Play, we bring you the best of 2003, honoring such games as The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, Ratchet & Clank Going Commando, and The Prince of Persia. Who will win Game of the Year? I bet something will strap in! It's Platitude Time! Welcome to X-Play's Best of 2003 Award Show, pre-recorded live in the beautiful Studio 3 Pavilion. We're honored to introduce your illustrious hosts, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome to X-Play. Tonight, we celebrate the best games of 2003 with pomp, circumstance, and awkward pauses. Morgan? Thank you, Adam. Video games, where would we be without them? Probably playing marbles, rolling an iron hoop down the street, or reading. Uh, mm. Now this year, video games touched our lives, our hearts, and our hands. From breathtaking recreations of the Battle of Normandy to a title that puts the eye in Jedi, we've seen that games can take us to places we've never been before. Places that only exist in the developer's imaginations. Places where you can enter a truly rich and immersive world, and then kill everything that lives in it. Our selection process was a rigorous one. We debated the merits of each game endlessly, often threatening. Oh, damn it, Carson, vote for freaking Wind Waker! Sometimes firing coworkers who disagreed with us. Look, vote for Deus Ex or you're fired. No, you're fired! You're all fired! And never was there a more heated debate than the one over the category of the year's best game. Now, the nominees for the best game of the year are, wait, we'd have to be stupid to announce that award at the beginning of the show. Instead, Adam will start the show by performing a musical tribute to the nominees. Ooh, uh-oh. No. Adam will start the show by performing a musical tribute to the nominees. You're supposed to do a medley or something. Hell no. But, but the producer said we needed a musical act. No, no, never mind. Never mind what those community college dropouts past green as producers said. We love games. We love playing them. And we just want to honor the titles that made us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do. Can, can I go back to reading the prompt for now? I'm fine, just go on flaunting your literacy. Without any further ado, let's get to our first category, Best Fighting Game. And the nominees are... Guilty Gear X2. <laughs> Soul Calibur 2. <laughs> Virtual Fighter 4 Evolution. Capcom vs. SNK2 EO. <laughs> And the winner of the best fighting game is Envelope, please. Soul Calibur 2. Oh! Those are three little words that translate into hours of fighting joy. The Soul Calibur series has always distinguished itself with its weapons based combat that anyone can get into quickly. Although there's more than enough sweet moves available to the gamer that chooses to spend some time learning their stuff. 
None of that has changed with version 2 that is now available to any gamer with a modern console. Prettier, better balanced, and it has Link. This is easily the best fighter of 2003. From fighting to shooting, video games have a little violence for everyone. And ever since Wolfenstein 3D was released in 1992, the first person shooter has become a staple of America's video game diet. It's a diet made richer and creamier by the addition of these first person shooters. What the hell did I just read? I have no idea. Let's be honest, the field for best first person shooter wasn't exactly broad this year. I mean, with games like New World Order and Devastation. Devastation. How do we make this decision? Pretty damn easily. In a year where the first person shooter found itself cell shaded, squad based, and massively multiplayable, one title stood heads and helmets above the rest. And the nominees for best first person shooter are Call of Duty, Deus Ex Invisible War, Planet Side, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Three. And the winner of the best first person shooter. Oh, do you want to open it or, or should I? I'm gonna open it, I wanna open it. Oh my God, it's Call of Duty. We love you, we really love you. From the moment it starts, you know Call of Duty is different. A first person shooter is designed to immerse you in the action and Call of Duty does that better than any other game in its class. With brilliant teammate and enemy AI active all around you, Call of Duty manages to place you inside the action. You're one of many rather than the sole focus. The result is one of the most exhausting, exhilarating, and terrifying experiences in gaming. If the first person shooter aims to immerse, then Call of Duty takes you as close to actual battle as anyone should want to be. And now we come to the category of best sports game. Sports. A lot of gamers aren't good at them, but within the confines of a simulated world, even a 400 pound man with limited motor skills can be king of the tennis court, or the gridiron, or the waffle iron. Wait for laughter. Smile. Our nominees for best sports game encompass four vastly different athletic events. Three come to us from powerhouse EA Sports, and one comes courtesy of Microsoft but they all have an ability to entertain both sports fans and gamers alike. And for the first time in 2003, online play on the consoles has become a major factor in our decision. The nominees for best sports game are... NBA Street Volume 2 Madden NFL 2004 Top Spin <laughs> Tiger Woods PGA Tour 2004 and the envelope, please. It's my turn to open the damn envelope. And the winner for best sports game is Madden NFL 2004. Oh! Oh! Yes, it comes out every year, but 2003 has been a kind year to the Madden series. The annoying bugs and glitches that have plagued the game have all but disappeared, creating a vision of the gridiron that's as close to the real thing as most of us will ever get. Madden demonstrates a love of the game that's apparent in the depth evident in everything, from the playbook to the unbelievable franchise mode. This is a title that for some never leaves their console from the moment it's popped in. People are fanatical about role-playing games, and why shouldn't they be? Well, for one, many are terrible and feature dying parents and cloying Japanese children on quests. They promise that you'll truly inhabit a role and that your actions will have consequences but they rarely deliver on that promise. Instead, you have to kill rabbits and wolves for 14 hours. This year, however, one RPG broke new ground and lived up to the hype. The nominees for best RPG are... Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic. Golden Sun 2, The Lost Age. Mario and Luigi, Superstar Saga. Disgaea, Hour of Darkness. And the winner is... Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. <gasps> Knights of the Old Republic is one of the freshest takes on the role-playing game in years. Firstly, by using the science fantasy universe of Star Wars, the genre is liberated from the tired high fantasy and anime settings. 
<laughs> More importantly, the game actually lets you play a role. The decisions you make determine the direction the story takes. There is no right or wrong outside of your own ethical compass. How come I get the feeling you're trying to take us for a ride? With an exceptional story, mature treatment of the material, and pacing that doesn't let go of you, Knights of the Old Republic is a landmark title that is easily the best RPG of 2003. Stick around. When we come back, we have more of the year's best games, more awards, and more of the band leader trying to get me to wrap things up. It's time to slay the dragon. About time. Anyone else on? We've got 12 of the team online. Yeah, let's do this. You can become a hero and join thousands online in an epic adventure. EverQuest Online Adventures, now online for PlayStation 2, rated T for Teen. Dun, 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 dun. She's one of Femme Fatale's sexiest women of 2003, and his mom reassures him daily. Here are your glamorous co-hosts, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to X-Play's Best of 2003 award show. We've got nice clothes and, sadly, a rented band leader. And tonight, we give a little something back to the industry that has given us so much. Carpal tunnel syndrome, an addiction to Red Bull, and accidental exposure to Final Fantasy fan fiction. Smile. But they also made 2003 the year of the platformers. The nominees for best platformer are... Kaya, Dark Lineage. Ratchet and Clank, Going Commando. Jack, Two. Rayman, Three, Hoodlum Havoc. And the winner is... Oh, I'm so happy for them. Ratchet and Clank, Going Commando. Awesome. With the introduction of weapons-based combat, Ratchet and Clank opened up what a platformer could be. Now, with Going Commando, they taught everyone what it should be. With careful attention to level design and complex enemy AI, developer Insomniac Games have made the first truly sophisticated platformer. A game that requires both planning and timing and has so much variety, it could have filled three separate titles. The polish in Going Commando shines so brightly, you start to see the future of a genre in its reflection. And now, the interns. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. They let us out of the cage to present this award, didn't they, Chris? Ad lib? Ad lib? Uh, we're here to give the award for best racing game, and before we read the nominees, we wanted to clarify something. They only beat us a little. Wait for laughter. But seriously, we picked up the nominees for this category because in every one of these games... Whether they were trick-based or involved cars or spaceships... Crossing the finish line was the primary objective. And the nominees for best racing game are... SSX3. Project Gotham Racing 2. Mario Kart Double Dash. F-Zero GX. And the winner is Mario Kart Double Dash. Exit stage. Oh. <gasps> yeah, it's not realistic, but it's fun. Mario Kart Double Dash takes a simple concept and makes it one of the most compulsive gaming experiences around. 
Easy to pick up and play, but near impossible to put down. Double Dash offers a beautiful rendering of one of the most satisfying racing series ever. But it's the multiplayer that gives the game endless appeal. The way it can make four grown adults spend hours yelling in excitement as they hurl turtle shells at one another makes this the best racing game of 2003. For as long as mankind has existed, we've sought adventure. From the caves of primitive man to the... Sound like I'm on the Discovery Channel. Adam? Thanks, Morgan. Mm -hmm. The adventure category combines multiple game styles, combat, puzzle solving, and light. RPG elements. This year, the nominees for Best Adventure Game take us from the sands of the Middle East to a creepy carnival, from a mystical quest to a pig with fart-powered boots. Yeah, I read that right. The nominees for Best Adventure are... Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Beyond Good and Evil. Go have a look. The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker. Dark Cloud 2. The winner is The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker. The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker is exactly what an adventure title should be. With the simple story of heroism, you travel through a vast and cohesive world so filled with character and intrigue that the game comes alive. The engaging puzzles, appallingly enjoyable combat, and near obsessive side quests make Wind Waker one of the hardest games to relinquish in favor of sleep. If that weren't good enough, the risk and reward of its incomparable graphics make it a game you wish would never end. Yeah! Stick around when we come back. Celebrities, the award for best action game, and later, the award for best game. One, two, play with the milk set! Welcome back to X-Play's Best of 2003 Award Show. Let's welcome two very special guests to the ceremony. If you saw the film The Last Samurai, he'll seem very familiar and appealing to the ladies. And pop culture would have a gaping hole were it not for his portrayal of Richie Tenenbaum. Presenting the award for Best Graphics, here are Tom Cruise and Luke Wilson, lookalikes. Graphics. They're so much more than just another pretty face. That's right, Tom. Without graphics, there'd be nothing but an empty screen and a lot of confusing noises. Uh, Luke, this year the staff of X-Play judged graphics based on technical and creative achievements. This year brought us so shaded superheroes, mystical worlds, and dragons flying through waterfalls. Dragons flying through waterfalls? You guys are dorks. Shut up. We're getting paid. The <coughs> nominees for best graphics are... Beyond Good and Evil. Beautiful Joe. Crimson Skies, High Road to Revenge. Panzer, Dragoon, Order. And the winner is... <laughs> Crimson Skies, High Road to Revenge. Can I get my gift back now? While many games look pretty, Crimson Skies has managed to blend technical excellence with amazing visual creativity to create a world that is both slightly familiar and utterly unbelievable. The Goliath buildings, dwarfing natural scenery, and a horizon far in the distance convey a sense of humbling awe while you pilot your aircraft. It's the small and impressive details of the environments and aircraft that drive home all the creative energy in the visuals. The game articulates a parallel past that has no comparison and never ceases to fascinate. It's an honor to be back. Ad lib. Ad lib. <laughs> a strategy. If we were any good at it, we would have found a way to replace Admin Morgan a long time ago. <laughs> The nominees for best strategy game are Rise of Nations, Ghostmaster, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, Advance Wars 2, Black Hole Rising, and the winner is Rise, Rise of, of Nations. Nations. Oh, that's cool. 
The achievements of Rise of Nations are amazing. Big Huge Games have returned strategy to the genre by reducing the tedium of managing your resources and giving you several methods of conquering your foes. The fast pacing of the game makes building and protecting your empire a breathless experience as military, economic, and cultural evolution all drive your manifest destiny. Rarely is there a real-time strategy game where the single and multiplayer experiences are equally incomparable, but Rise of Nations excels at both. This is one revolution in gaming we hope conquers all. And now, the award for best action game. And the nominees are... Beautiful Joe. Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne. Panzer Dragoon Orda. Crimson Skies, High Road to Revenge. And the winner is, the envelope please. Beautiful Joe. Design and gameplay meet and fall in love with one another in one of the most original games since, well, games. With deceptively simple button mechanics, Capcom has created a game that is easy to pick up and becomes obsessively impossible to give up as you confront each new challenge. Here's the rare title where it's no problem to play the same level for the 14th time because it's that pleasurable and fun to play. Add to that a screwball attitude and a visual style without any peer and you've got exactly what gaming's all about. Imagination and having a damn good time. We're getting down to the moment that you've been waiting for. When we come back, the best game of the year! What? The best game of the year! Huh? <laughs> That's it. Lip, lip to the right. Oh. Oops. This portion of G4 is brought to you by Bandai.hack. When does fantasy begin? When does reality end? Dot hack. Is it just a game or something far more dangerous? <laughs> Dot hack part one. Game and DVD for PlayStation 2 from Bandai. Rated T for Teen. I think my partner's a rat! We gotta shut him up! They want a war? They got a war. Grand Theft Auto 3. Out now for PlayStation 2 and PC. Rated M for Mature. <laughs> Presenting the final award for best game of the year, it's your glamorous co-hosts, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to Netflix Best of 2003 show. We reach our final award of the evening. We've seen so much this year that boiling the games down into just five selections for best game was absolutely devastating! Did you? Anyway, every one of these games was an absolute gem. Adam? Thanks, Morgan. Mm -hmm. We really can't say enough, but the quality of the final five, the games in this category are all groundbreaking, genre-defining, and worth every penny. From a game where you choose between the dark side and the light to a title that played like a superhero comic come to life, it was a year full of triumphs. After fierce debate, we boiled it down to five, and from five, only one will emerge victorious. So, without further ado, the nominations for... Thank you, Grand Theft Auto 3. The nominees for best game of the year are... The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker. Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Rise of Nations. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Beautiful Joe. 
and the winner for best game of the year is... Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Oh, that's awesome. Knights of the Old Republic is our game of the year, not just because it's a stupendous game, but because developer Bioware took risks by trying to innovate and create something new, and boy, did it pay off. KOTOR is one of those rare games that rewards you for really playing the game. The more you investigate and talk to other characters, the richer and more complex the story becomes. But it's the way in which you as the player feel that you're actually having an impact on the story, rather than being led by the hand through a fixed narrative that sets this game far apart from its peers. Your actions have real repercussions. As you slip to either the dark or light side, your involvement in the game becomes a creative act in itself. Knights of the Old Republic has set a new high watermark for games, and we're proud to reward it by proclaiming it to be the best game of 2003. It's been a great year full of special gaming memories, and we're glad you shared them with us. Thanks for joining us tonight. If I... Why won't you just die? Die! Ben, I'm out of here. happening on Pulse. Namco dominated arcades in the 1980s with games like Dig Dug and Pac-Man. But that was then. This is now. We'll fill you in on the fate of Namco arcades. Plus, we'll take another look at the Vivani lifestyle. And we'll join JP Money as he enters a local Dance Dance Revolution contest. Will Mr. Money live up to his name? That's what's coming up this week for all the news in the world of games. Make sure to watch what you play right here on Pulse. After you. You're the prey in a deadly game. You must do anything to survive. Can you stop the hunt before you are taken down? Manhunt by Rockstar Games. Rated M for Mature. Burnout 3 Takedown. Buckle up. Rated T for Teen. EA Kings. Challenge everything. Papa's back with a brand new bag of tricks. <laughs> Crypto's back to probe the world and unleash a devastating new arsenal of alien weapons and mental abilities. Go out, dude. Destroying humans is my business, and business is good. <laughs> This time, team up with a friend and destroy all humans together. Did you miss me? Destroy all humans too. Rated T for Teen. Reserve your copy today. Stay tuned. Filter next. Do you remember where you were on 9999? Did you ever think a fighting game could be so addictive? Or that a polygonal blue hedgehog could look so good? Dust off that old white console because it's time to count down your favorite Dreamcast games right now on Filter. And welcome to Filter, a hand-picked top 10 video game countdown is voted on by you, the viewer, at G4TV.com. From arrow wings to zombie revenge and everything in between, the Sega Dreamcast went from the top of the console world to the bottom faster than you can say PS2. But along the way, the little white console that could delivered some groundbreaking titles that still look and play great today. And this unforgettable console deserves some unforgettable recognition. So today, I stand before you as its most unforgettable character, ooh la la. So it's with great reverence, high esteem, and some bittersweet nostalgia that we look back on your favorite Dreamcast games. 
But before we do that, we thought you might want to know a little bit of the history behind Sega's Great White Hope and what made it so great in the first place. Dreamcast was a Sega console that was put out in the late 90s. I thought the system was going to do really well. I was really excited about its release. It had really good hardware for the time. It was Sega's next big console after the Sega Saturn. The Sega Saturn was a miserable failure for Sega, and they really wanted to get back into the race. So they put out the Dreamcast way before any of these next generation systems came out. Unfortunately, they might have been a little bit too early. It came at a sort of awkward time, and right before the release of PlayStation 2. So unfortunately, it didn't build the uh, fan base that it could have. It kind of has a special place in a lot of gamers' hearts because there were a lot of great games for it, a lot of very, I guess you can call them gamers' games. It wasn't selling as well, I guess, as the other platforms because some of the other consoles were doing better. They could make more mediocre titles and lots of them, but the Dreamcast had this small library and a lot of the games were actually really excellent and original. they still make games for the Dreamcast. I don't understand how two years pass and the system still is as powerful as the newer generation systems that are on the market right now, yet nobody's made a game for it in ages. So now that you know what made the Dreamcast great, let's get to the countdown. We begin with a title that proved country club members aren't the only ones who can enjoy a little racket action. At number 10 is Virtua Tennis. Virtual Tennis is a fantastic game. It's uh, it's basically simplicity defined. You know, so uh, you just move the joystick, press one button. Um, it's about as simple as tennis is itself, and just as complex. Usually, tennis games were kind of limited in terms of movement around the court, but with Virtual Tennis, it's not like a basic pong type game or a ping pong type game. I mean, it actually required a great degree of skill. That was like the very first tennis game that I played that was actually realistic. The player models looked really real. The speed for the game was just right, you know, it seemed really realistic. Virtual Tennis is by far the best tennis game I've ever played, um, John Rager. Virtual Tennis helped take you off the couch and onto the court. Our next game helped bring the arcade to your living room, which inevitably put your ass right back on the couch. For that faction of the population who enjoys hunting the undead, House of the Dead 2 is for you. House of the Dead 2 is a funny shooting game. Um, I think the thing that I remember most about House of the Dead 2 are these kind of ridiculous uh, voice acting. Please be safe, G. It was a very fast-paced game, but it also had some really uh, amusing dialogue. I don't want to die! The voice acting was terrible, but that made it cool. It made it funny and fun. Unfortunately, House of the Dead 2 came out right after the Columbine shooting, so Sega was like, you know what, we can't release the gun. There's no way we can release the gun peripheral. Of course, everyone went ahead and bought the import version so you can use a light gun. If you like the feel of cold steel in your hands, but you also enjoy pummeling enemies with your fists, then you're a prime candidate for our next game. Utilizing power-ups, weapons, and interactive environments, Power Stone was a fighting game that broke new ground for digital pugilists, which is exactly why it comes in at number eight. Power Stone is probably my most favorite uh, game from the Dreamcast library. It's uh, sort of classic Capcom stuff. It's fast, it's fun, it's colorful, it's, uh, it's got lots of character. It was really a nice mix between sort of complex and uh, simplistic gameplay. Power Stone is a cool type of game that's a 3D fighter, but for up to four people, and throwing not just punches and kicks, but also throwing items, and you have to watch out for things in the environment attacking you, and all sorts of stuff. 
was a crazy fighting game. I mean, you could throw stuff around and throw stuff at each other, you know, even throw each other. And uh, it's probably, in many ways, it, it could also be seen as kind of a precursor to Super Smash Brothers. So, Power Stone is the first fighter to appear in our list, but I have a strong suspicion that it won't be the last. Anyway, we need to take a break, but when we come back, we'll continue our countdown of your top 10 Dreamcast games of all time, and we'll see what some Dreamcast have been up to since retiring. Daniel Gleason. Whoa, 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 whoa. My favorite video game of all time would have to be Tech Mobile. Deep, 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 deep. I whipped many a booty in Tech Mobile and still will. Hot, 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 hot. That's what I'm talking about. Welcome back to Filter. I'm Diane Mizoda counting down your favorite Dreamcast games. The rankings for filter shows come directly from the responses you post on the G4 website. To make your vote count, log on to g4tv.com slash filter and select the filter rater. Then choose a category, vote on a scale of 1 to 10, and we'll take care of the rest. While you're there, be sure to post your suggestions for topics and games you'd like to see covered in future episodes. But let's get back to this episode. Coming in at number 7 is an RPG that takes the art of piracy to new heights. Literally. You play a cloud-faring scurvy dog who sets sail in the skies of Arcadia. Skies of Arcadia was a huge uh, RPG for the Dreamcast. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they think of RPGs, they think uh, during that time it was either a 2D thing or it was a kind of a polygon, characters with pre-rendered backgrounds. But this thing was all full poly 3D. So a lot of people got a real good taste as a different kind of RPG. And uh, it was so popular that it also moved into the GameCube. Big Dreamcast RPG that uh, introduced a cast of pirates who were actually good pirates, and you could take your ship around and have these really cool ship-to-ship -ship battles, which is probably the best part about the game. And you were always flying from like floating city to floating city, which is pretty much a standby in most RPGs. But this game, just the scope and the scale of it was so grand and cool that it made it really different and fun. Okay, so the pirates in Skies of Arcadia don't exactly make your neck hair stand up, but they sure know how to dress. Anyway, our number six title is a game that takes good music, amazing visuals, and a unique concept and puts them together in a tight package called Jet Grind Radio. For all you rollerblading graffiti artists, this one's for you. Jet Grind Radio was probably one of the first games that put cell shading onto the map. It, it had a really cool art style, it had a unique combination of gameplay, and that whole graffiti thing and the look of the game really complemented each other. Just the overall style of the game, from the music to the design of the characters to the plot of, you know, you're this group of kids that's going around um, spraying graffiti all over Tokyo definitely had a huge impact uh, on the industry as a whole. For the first time I saw a trailer, I couldn't believe they were making a game based on something like this. You know, when you booted up the game, it had a little warning, you know, please don't do this, or graffiti is art. So, it's just another thing that Sega kind of did differently compared to the competitors. The Dreamcast made its U.S. debut on September 9th, 1999, and showed a lot of promise. But a mere four years later, the system was virtually forgotten thanks to the release of its three next-generation console competitors. So where'd they all go? Um, I still play it. 
yeah, so I don't miss it too much. It's sitting in the closet right now, but I still pull it out every once in a while. My Dreamcast, I have actually like four or five of them in a box in my apartment, sitting away, disused, covered in dust, unfortunately. It's hooked up to my TV. I have two Dreamcasts hooked up to the TV, a Japanese one and an American one. I still play it every other day. My Dreamcast is in the basement now. My Dreamcast is in my cabinet next to my television, probably with my Nintendo 64. <laughs> I don't miss the Dreamcast that much because I still have them unplugged in, so I, uh, I, still, I still visit it once in a while. Actually, I still have it. It's still hooked up in my living room. It's hard being a game reviewer to actually find some time to play older games. We were sleeping one night and a cat came in and took a dump inside my Dreamcast. <coughs> it avoided all the other consoles, went straight to the Dreamcast. Very sad, really, but uh, there you go. And ever since then, uh, it's never been quite the same. Probably a couple of them will be sold on, uh, on eBay. I'll probably just keep one Japanese one and one US one. My Dreamcast is collecting dust in the basement. You know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff down in the basement, too, so uh, I'm sure it's got a lot of company. Well, those aren't really the creative answers we were looking for. Personally, I prefer to use my Dreamcast as a blender on margarita night. Okay, we're about to break into the sweetest buy presented by Juicy Fruit, so let's get to it. Fantasy Star Online was the first console RPG to take the action online, and it comes in at number five. Check it out. Fantasy Star Online is one of the Dreamcast's greatest games. This is a game that took the multiplayer online RPG and brought it to consoles, and it did it completely different from how people were doing it on the PC, and people have lost friends, wives, girlfriends, you know, to that game. Like like any great addictive online game, that game has, has caused a lot of trouble. Like, just to give you an idea of how addicted I was to this game, the power went out in my apartment. Um, and my apartment had two different separate uh, fuses. The refrigerator and one light was on one, and the entire rest of the apartment was on the other. So the entire rest of the apartment, I lost power. So I unplugged the refrigerator, like dragged my TV and Dreamcast over into there and, and plugged it in just so that I could continue playing. Because there was no way I was going to stop. I was going to stop playing Fancy Star Online. While the seminal sitcom from the 70s, Taxi, put a human perspective on cab drivers, it wasn't until Crazy Taxi came to the Dreamcast in 2000 that people realized how much fun being a hat could be. And that's exactly why it comes in at number four. Crazy Taxi was another arcade game that got brought to the Dreamcast. It was basically a game where you would drive around and pick up passengers and take them places and get money for it. It was a score-based game. Just kind of crazy. It was downtown San Francisco, and we kind of modeled after that. Um, and it was awesome music, and just basically it was like something you could play for five, ten minutes and be satisfied with. You're able to take that fantasy and, you know, just run through everything and get them out of your car as fast as possible. And you get to listen to some pretty cool music, Offsprings, soundtracks in the game. Crazy Taxi was probably the best arcade to console transition that I've seen. I mean, it really captured the whole craziness of the arcade game, and they had all these brand stores in there, like Tower Records and like Kentucky Fried Chicken and stuff like that, so it's a crazy game, like the name says. If you're a serious Dreamcaster, then you already have a pretty good idea of what our top three games are. But come on, what's the fun in knowing everything? Stick around, because after the break, you may be surprised at which title claimed the number one spot. And we'll also take a look at some of the weirdest Dreamcast games of all time. That'll happen when Filter returns. insidious weapon ever conceived. How do you protect millions of people from millions of possible threats? How do you find the source of our greatest fears? Bring the battle closer. Away. Tom Clancy.
see Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. Welcome back to Filter. I'm Diane Mizota, counting down your favorite Dreamcast games of all time. With seven down and three to go, let's review where we've been so far. Virtua Tennis serves up the winner and aces the number 10 spot. House of the Dead 2 brings arcade action to the living room and occupies ninth place. Fighting its way into the eighth slot is the melding of fisticuffs and fine jewelry Power Stone. Skies of Arcadia takes to the clouds and flies into the number 7 slot. Vandalizing the competition at number 6 is Jet Grind Radio. The world's first online console RPG claims the fifth spot in the form of Fantasy Star Online. And Crazy Taxi goes off the beaten path to take the number four slot. In the number three title, there is no beaten path. It's up to you to create the path yourself. And you, Suzuki's open-ended masterpiece, Shenmue. Shinmu is a still incredibly controversial game. You either love it or hate it. It was an interesting game. I think it was a little bit like too much like real life. <laughs> Sometimes the dialogue was a little crazy and you didn't understand because of through the translation. What do you know about the incident? The incident? Yes. What do you know about the incident? You should ask the old lady. Ask the old lady about the incident. The day of the incident. The day of the incident? So it's really stunted, long-winded dialogue where I'm just like hitting the button like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's find the old lady now. It was a very different experience for games. Uh, we still haven't seen anything quite like it since, but unfortunately, it was a game that was mired with the Dreamcast's failure. It was definitely one of Sega's most expensive games they've ever made, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't do too well for them. Shenmue was unusual in that the game's environment was completely interactive. While Shenmue was different, the Dreamcast also had a chair flat-out bizarre game. But which ones were the most bizarre? Dreamcast had tons of cool weird games. Sega is known for their classic foil. My favorite one was Samba de Amigo. It had um, crazy cartoon monkeys. My personal favorite would be Chuchu Rocket. Chuchu Rocket was the first console online game, I believe. It was created by Sonic Team initially internally as an experiment for Dreamcast's online connectivity, and they decided to release it as a game in itself. Another one of my favorite ones was Typing of the Dead. You could use the keyboard and basically play House of the Dead, but instead of shooting, you had to type out a sentence quickly enough so you could shoot the zombies. Space Shuttle Fly was another pretty bizarre offering from Sega. It was basically a music game, but it featured ooh la la, swishing around like a model, so this was really quite like nothing that team had done before. Well, definitely the most bizarre Dreamcast game without a question is Seaman. You can package with a microphone and basically the idea was that you nurture this bizarre underwater creature and eventually develop a relationship with it. Ask him how his day's going, he'll ask you how your day's going. To basically corresponding with a fish. And so eventually it would sort of make these sort of unnerving uh, observations about your life or ask you why you weren't home at the regular time and stuff like that. That pretty much takes the cake in terms of bizarre though. Okay, we've reached the point in the show where you determine the number one Dreamcast game of all time. So are you about adventure or do you believe in soul? Sonic Adventure followed the exploits of the world's most famous blue hedgehog after his 128-bit facelift. Although the game stayed true to its platforming roots, it marked the first time Sonic had ever appeared in the third dimension. Soul Calibur was the killer app of the Dreamcast launch, and even today it still wows anyone who sees it. But which of these Dreamcast launch titles is the best of all time? The only way to find out is to check out the Filter Face-Off. Well, Sonic Adventure is, I think, what everyone bought the Dreamcast for when it first came out. I, they wanted to see Sonic in full 3D. Sonic is a great character show, processor speed. I mean, he's just running full blast, and, you know, the environment's moving really quickly, and it, it was a very impressive title for the Dreamcast at that time. Oh, oh, that game was sweet. Sweet graphics, sweet levels, especially the courses. Most of the loops and stuff they have on it, so it makes it fun. 
It was just Fast and Furious when you played the Sonic character. You could play as other characters, you know, from the series. Just kind of a fun game. Some people didn't like, you know, the open environments, kind of the adventure part of the game, but um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Soul Calibur is the game that sold the Dreamcast. It was just incredible. I mean, out of nowhere, this great, deep, gorgeous fighting game. It was a one-on-one -on -one fighting game where the players fought with, like, weapons. It was pretty much the first game of that kind, so it was a pace setter in that genre. In a certain sense, I think the original Dreamcast version of Soul Calibur was more impressive than the sequels that came out last year for PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. If there's one game that people still have the Dreamcast and they're still playing on, it's probably Soul Calibur. People even probably have that super glued into their Dreamcast and they never take it out. You'd be pretty hard pressed to find someone who doesn't agree that these are the top two Dreamcast games of all time. But only one can be crowned the champion, and based on your votes, the best Dreamcast game of all time is Soul Calibur. The best part of this countdown is that you can buy most of these games for less than 20 bucks. Well, that wraps up this episode of Filter. Remember, the opinions expressed on this show are yours, not mine. So make your vote count on future episodes by logging on to the Filter show page at g4tv.com slash filter. Until then, I'm Diane Mizoda, and I'll see you next time. I kind of see video games kind of like the evolution of movies and storytelling. You get to immerse yourself in a world, any world you want. I don't remember a time without games. I mean, I'm 24, Nintendo came out in 85, we had an Atari before then, we had a Commodore 64 before, you know. So I've always been around games, always. Pong, I remember playing Pong. Hours and hours at Galaga. My favorite game, by the way, is Galaga still, by far. Rated T for Teen. You gotta watch your back. Chris Benoit tried to take me out in the elimination chamber. You're nothing, Lesnar. And that punk this John, John Cena, Cena. I run this terrain. Here comes the pain. Came after me backstage. But no matter what they do, no matter how hard they try. There is nothing and no one that can stop me. You and me, bra and panties match right now. I win. No, Brock, we all win.
SmackDown. Here comes the pain. Nintendo GameCube. Hey, I'm Mark McGrath. I know nothing about video games. I'm trying to learn, and you are watching G4. God bless you guys. What's up, everybody? I'm Bill Sindelar, and you're watching Blister, where you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll kiss the next 30 minutes goodbye. We're here in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Convention Center in California for E3, the Electronic Entertainment Expo. Now, for gamers, this event, it is like the World Cup, where makers from all over the world get together to show off their goods, if you know what I mean. So, to prove to you that we care, well, sort of, we're going to cruise the floors and show you what it's like to be in the eye of the E3 storm, Blister style. We're also going to go goth with the dark actioner, Chaos Legion. We'll prove that you don't know Jack about Jack, too. And it's Star Wars game time again with the Knights of the Old Republic. But first, take a deep breath and relax. Let us show you the way to pure E3 Nirvana. Either that or one hell of a pounding headache. Oh, someone got in with a fake ID. Hey, it's loud. I don't know if you can hear me now, but there are 80,000 fans in the stands. I'm not a booth fan, man. Dude, it's Nicolas Cage. All the stars come out of E3. No. like this game? Is it fun? It's awesome. It's awesome. We love John. Now wait a minute. You work. You got one of these flower shirts on, so you work for these guys. That's why you have to say it. Let's see your G4 tattoo. But see, she didn't go for the little one. She's a G4 rebel. You want to get a really cool tattoo? And then, what's even cooler is they make you put the G4 right up on top there. See, I got G4 too. Yeah. Yeah, but mine says G4 pimp. You want to see where it is? No. I can't show you. I gotta shave the hair off first, then you'll see it. When you're here at E3, there's a lot of things that you can do. You can check out the games, you can dye your hair blue and make yourself look like a smurf. What is it? Maybe it's payment for doing this interview, you can shave my No, I'm okay. okay. From games to booth babes to people that got in under false pretenses, E3 has it all. And there's just so much going on there that it's just impossible to show it all. But don't worry, we won't let you down. But now, let's just do something, you know, like completely nuts. Maybe by just showing you a hot new video game. <laughs> it's time to take a peek at the very dark, very mysterious, and just a little bit intense Chaos Legion. With gothic opera action, Chaos Legion is a game that combines frenetic fisticuffs with lots and lots of melodrama for yo mama. Good evening and welcome to Unsolved Blister Mysteries. Tonight, we'll be looking at the mysteries surrounding the upcoming Capcom game, Chaos Legion. Chaos Legion is indeed a mystery wrapped inside of a soft shell enigma dipped in riddles, steeped in secrets, and 
covered all over an intrigue. In this never-before-seen interview, perhaps Yoshinori Ono, the producer of Chaos Legion, can try to answer these questions. As much as I would love to tell you more about the story, the more I talk about it, the more it's going to ruin the plot. But I can tell you this much. It's a story where it doesn't have a clear good and a clear-cut bad. The lines between good and bad are blurred, and the player actually is going to have to play through the entire story to understand the different perspective and motivations of the characters. And those that they thought were bad may not necessarily have been bad. And those that seem good may have made a few mistakes and wrong turns in their paths on the way to where they've gotten. The main characters you'll be able to play in the game were all friends at one time. At least, that's what we've been told. Our staff did further research and found out this interesting bit of information. Well, there's one main character in the game who you play, and his name is Zeeb. His old friend, Victor De La Croix, he's turned evil. And uh, basically, he is who, in the end, you're trying to fight, and he who is, who is creating chaos in the world right now, and that's what you're trying to put an end to. Friend versus friend, man versus man. Sieg will spend the entire game tracking down his former friend, Victor. You see, Victor has control of a mysterious evil power, and Sieg will have to stop him. The trail will take Sieg through ancient ruins, forests, cathedrals, and other gothic landscapes. The mystery continues. You can play as Sieg, but you can also play as a female character, and she is in a very short part of the game. The young lady Sieg meets on his travels seeks a vengeance for the destruction of her town and family. And yes, she blames Victor. She has guns and she has karate moves, and those are her powers. And uh, she was put in there as a way to kind of break it up and to, to kind of really move into the purest action for a short period of time. And then you come back, next level, you're going to come back and play as Sieg again. Once you've beaten the game, you can go through and play the whole game as her if you'd like to. Chaos Legion has been compared, some would say unfairly, to the Devil May Cry series. However, we can put that rumor to rest right now because as cool as Devil May Cry is, it doesn't have the legions. I wanted something that would totally symbolize power and not be a human form. So I came up with the legions. These summoned creatures that all have some attribute based on a weapon. That way, the main character could kind of feed off of their power, get the strength of their weapon, as well as visually, you can see that they're based on weapons, and they're more powerful than just a plain man. Actually, all the legions have attributes. They all belong to a certain type of class of weapon. So, you'll have a group of sword legions, as well as bow and arrow legions, and then there's the power legions as well. All of them have abilities and strengths based on what that weapon in real life, what kind of abilities it would have. For example, a bow and arrow can shoot things long distance. From what we've been able to unravel, Chaos Legions has been called a gothic opera of a video game. When I set out to make this game, I wanted to make the best possible game I could, a masterpiece. So, for me, it was an opus, an opera of terms. If you look at the structures in the land, they do look rather Romanesque, very gothic in style. As well as a lot of the backgrounds are dark, a little bit, perhaps, morbid. Our sources tell us Chaos Legion will conquer video games everywhere towards the end of 2003. Are you ready? You know, that Chaos Legion is one funky, tripped out game. And you know, could Capcom have another franchise on their hands? Well, time will tell. And speaking of time, we need to take a few moments to prepare for our next foray into the world of the big triple E. But when we return, we'll see what gamers are all geeked about and playing at E3. And because I love you, we'll look at the highly anticipated sequel, Jack 2, the follow up to 2001's Jack and Daxter. All this and a pocket full of lightsabers are coming up only here on Blister's E3 2003 extravaganza. It's time to enter. Oh. Blister Expansion Pack. We'll be right back.
action game of all time, Ninja Gaiden. Bring it for the Unleash your inner ninja. Oh, I'll take a pound of that. Huh? Xbox, it's good to play together. <laughs> My name is Dave Kramer, and I'm the world record holder for fastest completion of parking challenge number five in 18 Wheeler. It took me months of daily playing to whittle my time down. On my days off, while my wife and son were sleeping, I poured eight plus hours of non-stop gameplay. For some reason, I picked up this game very quickly. I mean, I'm usually pretty good at driving and racing games, but there was something about this. I guess it was that it was just unique. My favorite movie is a no-brainer, Star Wars. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and have been ever since I saw Episode 4 back in 77. I basically play games because it's kind of an escape. The same reason a lot of people read books and watch movies. The way I explain it best to those who don't like games is this. You watch movies, right? What could possibly be better than watching a movie and getting to be the lead? You can control the outcome, and you can try things in games you never could get away with in real life because it might cause some harm. Awesome record! You must be a pro! Record. Hello everybody, welcome back to Blister, I'm Bill Sinillar. Now we're here in Los Angeles at this year's Electronic Entertainment Expo. Oh, a gamer's paradise if there ever was one. And yes, this right here is the very Jeep that you will be drooling over in the latest Lara Croft movie, Cradle of Life, starring my very good friend Angelina Jolie. Now, Angelina and I, we both have something in common. She won an Oscar for Girl Interrupted, and I saw it. Which brings us to the great tag team of Jack and Daxter, the critically acclaimed platforming game from 2001. And now, just when we need them the most, Jack and Daxter return in the sequel, Jack 2. Let the adventure commence. Yes, everybody's favorite fighting elf has returned. Jack is back in Jack 2, the sequel to the acclaimed Jack and Daxter. This incarnation throws Jack into a dingy cityscape filled with evil forces. At the beginning of the game, uh, you go 500 years in the future to a time rift. You're immediately arrested, you're put in prison, and the Baron, Baron Praxis, uh, you meet very early on in one of the inner, interstitial scenes. He's uh, doing experimentation on Jack. Well, I'm always up for experimenting, but apparently being treated like a lab rat isn't so popular in the elven communities. Luckily, Daxer comes by and springs Jack from the clink. Jack vows to get revenge on the evil Baron Praxis. He heads off into the gritty city and into a most twisted story. Everything you do in Jack 2 specifically moves a plot forward, and it's a complex plot with characters that change personalities, that be a friend at one point, your enemy at other points. There are over 80 missions in the game that bring Jack through the expansive environments, including mountains, caves, sewers, and fortresses. But if you think all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, then you don't know Jack too. In addition to his platform pugilistics, Jack's seeking revenge with a whole new bag of toys. He now has a, a morphing gun, which allows him to attack enemies um, in four different modes. There's a, a shotgun mode, there's a, a rifle mode, there's a um, sort of a Vulcan cannon mode, and a homing missile mode. You have a hoverboard, which you can earn, that is always around then. There's dark jack moves, which are always around. There's vehicles to jump on at any time. You can do all of these things at the same time. These features are things that you can you can pretty much use anywhere. It's not the case of this is a hoverboard level, the only thing you can do there is hoverboard stuff for the most part. It's really very integrated. Yeah. Jack's favorite integration? The Dark Jack powers, which Jack got as a result of the Baron's Dark Echo experiments. They allow Jack to do combo moves, use smart bombs, and go wacko jacko. Something's happening to me. Something he did. I can't control it. You better get low jack on your eyelids, because these graphics are sparkling. The enhanced engine allows for beautiful shading and particle effects, and it keeps you jacked up with super quick load times. 
the engine is far more powerful. We're able to push a lot more polygons. We have more environment mapping. We have much better load systems, so we're able to display a lot more. Uh, our, our characters, as they speak, are now 10 to 15,000 polygons as opposed to the 3,000 polygons in last game. The perfect number of polygons for Daxter. The wily sidekick spends most of the game unsuccessfully hitting on the ladies and cracking rude jokes, but is playable in the later levels of the game, giving you the opportunity to be the weasel. But don't let Baron Praxis have all the fun experimenting. Try it yourself. Get on and hit the road, Jack. The road to Jack 2. Where would you be without me, eh, Dax? Well, Jack, I probably wouldn't be two feet tall, fuzzy, and running around in a sewer without a pair of pants. With an enhanced storyline and way more polygons, Jack 2 has improved much from the first game, but somebody, will you please explain to me why Daxter cannot have his name in the title of this game? I, I'm sorry? Oh, that's so, it's so interesting, isn't it? All right, well, Blister fans, we have teased and taunted you. Now it is time to show you. Come with us as we dive into the belly of the beast that is E3 and get to know your fellow gamers' perspectives on what's hot and what is even hotter. Hotter. You have waited, you're in line. They have not said, like, anything about Halo 2 and like any publications, they've like even in Electronic Gamers Monthly, they've had like make up what you want it to be like. What are you guys expecting when you walk in there? Um, same thing, bigger and better though. Bigger and better, like what? more weapons, more vehicles. But how do you do online? Online. Online. There's not too many girls that are here at E3 playing video games. No. Do you play a lot of video games? Yes, I do. You do? What's yeah. your favorite game? Buffy. For real? Really? What's different between this one and the other one? Um, you get to play different characters. Um, oh, because you're Willow right there. Yeah, you're Willow and you get to be Xander and yeah. And the it's the graphics are much better. Thank you're you guys. On Earth. You're fighting on Earth. How cool is that going to be? Fighting on Earth? Yeah. Yes, because there's never any fighting on Earth. Jerry, you've been playing Rogue Ops here for a little bit. What do you think of the game? It seems to have a lot of atmosphere and uh, you know, like the character has a lot of detail. Um, you know, you can crouch, shoot. It's really, it's action, and um, but there's a lot going on, so you can go through the level different, many different times, and there's always something new to find. So, yeah. always something new to find. Too many games. <laughs> Too many options, too many pixels, not enough Halo 2 sensory overload. I must overact to get out of this. <sighs> have you ever heard of a movie series called Star Wars? I'm talking to you, have you? Well, if you have, then we have got the game for you with Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. And later, things are going to get a little bizarre. I mean, really bizarre. Why? Because it's time for the Sindelar to make his presence felt here at E3, and it'll be felt only as the Sindelar can do it, right? Ha, you ready? I'm talking to you back of a trailer. We'll be back right here on Blister. Yo, what's up? This is Big Shaq. You're watching G4 TV for gamers. Morning, Tom. How are you? Morning. How are you? I'm watching your car. Yeah. Birds. Ow! What? Ah! Evolution from a claim, rated M for mature. The scent of blood. Okay, Pete here is going to try to hit hold on that target with the Devastator, a rocket launcher designed for Ratchet and Clank. Oh man! <laughs> oh! The Devastator, one of 36 weapons and gadgets not fit for this world. Rated T for team. I love video games, I love this mall, and I love you! Get ready! The Doo Den's coming to the Mall of America for eight weeks! Bring it online! Shout out at the Code Red Rant Room! Drink free do! Battle on Xbox Live Games! and win a chance to be on G4TV.com. Fantastic! Rant, play, drink, and win starting June 23rd. Do that, yeah!
Welcome back to Blister. I'm Lando Calrissian. The city, Los Angeles, the event is the E3 convention, the Electronic Entertainment Expo. The weather is a balmy 75 degrees, and we are about to go wild at E3. And when, you know, I say wild, I don't mean like Zach Wild, Ozzy's guitarist. I mean like crazy, wacky, somebody call the cops because you are not going to want to miss this. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far, far away. And when I say galaxy, I mean the LucasArts Company. A video game adventure was created. Let's enter the time-space continuum, go like 4,000 years into the past, and bond with the Knights of the Old Republic. <laughs> and then we'll go inside E3. <laughs> I've stood in lines for hours at the movies. I've been to sci-fi conventions dressed as Hammerhead. And yes, like you, I've hung Judge Jar Binks in effigy. And when it comes to Star Wars games, I've played all the shooters and I've followed Kyle Katarn on his path from dark to light. I've even rolled the dice in the tabletop Star Wars games, but that all comes to an end now. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is a third-person role-playing game set in the Star Wars universe about 4,000 years before the time in the movies. So it's a time of tremendous numbers of Jedi, tremendous numbers of Sith. And one of the key things about this game is that you can actually play dark or light side. You can actually be the hero and save the Republic, or you can be the ultimate villain in the galaxy. It's a really cool period uh, back where the, the game Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is situated. And so there's been space travel for, for about 20, 25,000 years. So the technology has definitely been there. And everything feels just like in the movies, but just a little older. And there's just a series of, uh, I think, six or seven comic books that define it, the Tales of the Jedi. And it's a period of, there's, there's Jedi all over the place. So your role in this game is to, to figure out your own heritage, to become a Jedi, to role play as a Jedi. Knights of the Old Republic uses a similar rule set to tabletop D&D games. There are three character classes that players can choose from with six stats that points can be attributed to. There are also eight non-combat skills that can be leveled up throughout the course of the game. One of the ways that we're going to innovate in this game, I think, is in the ability to create your own character and really customize that character so we can have someone choose their appearance and class and gender and really customize all your skills and feats and abilities so that uh, you can actually play the game exactly the way you want to. Um, for people who are new to it, we have basically a sort of uh, surface layer where if you just want to jump in and go straight into the game, it would be very intuitive to do that as well. Gamers will be able to go into battle in two different ways, real-time and turn-based. And you can transition between the two as much as you want. There are also nine AI-controlled allies that you can recruit to join your cause. Probably the biggest challenges that are you know, present in a Star Wars game is probably, I don't know how unique they are aside from the fact, like they may be sort of unique to what uh, Star Wars is, but also similar challenges that we face in our Dungeons & Dragons games like Neverwinter Nights and Baldur's Gate, and that is that you're dealing with an audience that really knows the subject matter, and so you've got to be very careful that your stuff fits what, you know, their vision of, of the universe should be, and I think that's been one of the unique challenges in, on Knights of the Old Republic, just trying to make sure that you match the uh, expectations of the audience. I could go on and on about the details of Knights of the Old Republic, but with a game this massive and steeped in fan lore, you're just going to have to search for the rest of your answers inside. Which path will you follow, light or dark? I'm guessing dark. Knights of the Old Republic, you'll get your Jedi, you'll get your Sith, you know, you'll even get to visit Tatooine. Poor man's Alderaan, you know, one of those peaceful planets with no weapons. <laughs> now who's living in a fantasy world? All right, it is time. Blister fans, are you ready to go in? Woo! Can you all show a little more excitement, maybe? Don't hurt yourselves. Look, I didn't wear a tight shirt. <sighs> anyway, I hope that there's more life inside and more of my fans. my own demonstration here on how to whoop some people's <laughs> some NFL football. It ain't easy being cheesy, is it? Nothing makes me happier than seeing a lady in line to see a preview of a war game. <laughs> I've always 
Chicken to Big American Idol. <laughs> oh, I want to see this. How many of you guys like the idea of a 24 hour video game channel? Don't be like MTV. Keep it video games 24 7. I don't want a video game reality show. No video game character sharing the market. All video games all the time on G4. Maybe we can get a Tyler on show. There though. goes the next season. So, why were you at the backyard wrestling booth? I'm going to check it out. You're going to. We know why you were at the booth. Don't lie to the people at home. The camera doesn't lie. Boot babe, thank you. What are these people? They're the new characters from Disney Toontown Online. Disney Toontown Online. So like if we were to play each other, like what's your character name? Do you go by different names all the time? Uh, I go by Kevin A. What is, what is it? Kevin A. All right, I go by the Sindel Stud. So if you get killed by the Sindel Stud online, that's me. Why are the girls from the wrestling throwing out Italian job balls? They've been blackballed. <laughs> I never thought the army be booming to NSYNC in one of these things. You guys got a nice system. Anyway, man, if you thought that was wild, well, you need to be on the lookout for our special DVD of Blister at E3, uncensored, with guest star Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Obviously, I know I'm lying. Or am I? All right, people, now I want to know which game featured at this year's E3 you're looking forward to the most. So log on to our message boards at g4tv.com slash blister and let me know. Well, that's it for Blister's look into the wonders of E3 for this year. I feel that we've all learned something and grown as a gaming community. So I'm going to go back in for some last-minute gaming info. So from the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles, I'm Bill Sindelar signing off for Blister. Now get on out of here. Go on, get out. I got some games to go play. You'll even get to visit Tatooine on poor man's Alderaan, you know, one of those peaceful planets with no weapons. <laughs> what now? Oh my god, who is behind me? <laughs> what? <laughs> Shouldn't you be a Panda Express serving people some orange chicken? What <laughs> Who is it? Get over here! Who? He kicked... He kicked... He kicked... <laughs> he was strong though, boy. <laughs> <laughs> A bit hard to take, eh, Arsenal? Rico. Madeira. It's time for some new heroes. Sonic Heroes. 12 heroes, 4 teams, one new game that never gets old. Premiering on Nintendo GameCube. Rated E for everyone.
over 20 unexpected characters in one big brawl. Now that's a fight. Super Smash Bros. Melee. Only for Nintendo GameCube. Rated T for Teen. Two teams square off on the quest for digital domination. It's destination vacation here on Arena. Welcome everyone to Arena, the show that turns multiplayer games into competitive sports. I'm Lee Raymond, and today we start on the road to the land of palm trees, drink umbrellas, and too much sunscreen. Every team that competes on Arena this season has one goal in mind, a free, all expenses paid vacation. Team Kaizen has been waiting since the end of last season for its chance to enter the Hall of Champions, but a new challenger in the form of Team Nim stands in their way. Let's get things rolling and check in with Kevin, who's in the console pit. Kevin. All right, thanks, Lee. Now, today we're kicking things off with Soul Calibur 2 on the Nintendo GameCube. Now, as the name implies, this is the second game in the fighting series that introduced a new generation of gamers to the genre. Featuring amazing graphics and addictive gameplay, Soul Calibur 2 is the reigning champion of fighting games. Players will fight one round each, and the overall winner will be the team that scores the most knockouts. And that's enough face time for me. Let's check out the action. One. And Soul Calibur 2 is underway. Team Kaizen will be fighting as Nightmare with Team Nim as Talim, Kevin. There she is, Talim brandishing her weapons, and Nightmare brandishing, looks like a Buick. About the size of the weapon, it's the motion in the ocean as Nightmare really takes it to Talim. Keep telling yourself that, way. And Talim gets in close, lands a blow on Nightmare. Nightmare spins around. Ooh. Lands a punishing blow on Talim. Talim's health deteriorating quickly here in round one. The Nightmare having early seemed a little clunky. And with a poke to the ribs, Nightmare sends Talim down. Two. And coming up on round two for Soul Calibur 2 for Team Kaizen, it is Mac. For Team Nim, it is Mastermind. And round two's underway. Nightmare off to a quick start, pummeling Talim, not even letting her get up off the ground. Oh, yeah. Very quiet match in the library today. And here comes Talim fighting back. Yeah, this ma this round was all nightmare, though. Oh, yeah. That's honest. As he knocks her down with a quick shoulder shrug and takes round two. Three. The console round is so far all Kaizen. We had slap shots versus ringworm. You're right there, Lee? Almost. Now, I know Nim went with Talim hoping to get at least one quick round. That way, they could secure the MVP in the event of a tie. But if they don't win this one. <laughs> And as if on cue, however, Kevin, you see slap shots laying it on the bigger nightmare. That's slap shoes. Yeah. Slap shoes yourself. Four. At round four, nightmare, two to one over Talim. This is the, the chance for Talim to even it up, Kevin. Absolutely. And in round three, we saw Team Nim with a quick, quick victory. That could help them with the MVP points if they manage to secure this round. But Nightmare's doing everything in his power, pummeling Talim, and he takes her down. And that'll do it for round four, Lee. Kaizen takes the console round. All right, well, it looks like Team Nim was going for the fastest round knockout, but unfortunately, they couldn't get the tie that they wanted. And as such, Team Kaizen takes the console round and one point. And in fact, Stacy Barcelona is with their best player right now, so let's hear what he has to say. Stacy. Oh, thank you, Kevin. I am here with Eska. Congratulations. Welcome back. How you feeling? Doing very good. We did pretty good at that game, and uh, we're going to take him out, I think. Well, how'd you do so good? You had a 20-second KO in Soul Calibur 2. 20-second KO? I don't know. I just handed him down a little ponage. Combo meal. Combo oh, oh, meal. Facial, facial, huh? Facial. Sounds good. Well, you are taking the early lead toward the MVP race and the three points to go with it. But right now, we are going to meet the rest of your team and their opponents, Team Nim. 
We played three episodes as Kaizen, and now we uh, sort of think about changing our name to formerly known as Kaizen. Uh, we're going to be A equals D is our new team name. Team formerly known as Kaizen. We're going to a uh, more of a symbol. Yeah, the name couldn't capture our actual <laughs> team spirit. Couldn't so, capture uh, our awesomeness. We played a lot of video games together. We played my three or four months worth completely together. Including yesterday, which was like 48 hours straight. Yeah. yeah. We uh, ruled Call of Duty. Duty. Kick ass. A whole lot of Call of Duty. Yeah. A whole lot of Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah. Whole lot Too of much Call of Duty. I do not think that <laughs> Team Nim is as good as other teams we played, like Minority. It's still probably the toughest people that yeah, we played. Minority for sure. They were real They're good. good. They seem like cool guys, but I just don't think they can beat us at video games. You're not Definitely supposed to say not. they look like cool guys. <laughs> they suck! But we're gonna beat them. That is what it comes down to, though, right? I got the team name in from uh, an idea I had since uh, I have a few hot mom friends, my buddy's moms and stuff. It's like that yeah. Stacy's mom song. No, I don't compare us to that. <laughs> How dare you? I've known David since we were like seven, and um, you know, Stan's his brother, so. I like, called up a bunch of people. I'm like, hey, you want to kill people and be on TV? And they're like, yeah, sure, we'll kill people and be on TV. <laughs> so you should get together and play DDR. David, like, as awkward as it sounds, this guy's amazing. Like, David's the DDR master. Yeah, he's just out there sweating and going, bah, 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 you know, getting out all those moves. Alex is called Wildcard for a reason. One game he'd have like 80 kills and no deaths. One game he'll have like one kill and like 50 deaths. So you never know, you know what's up. Well, I'm here to talk trash and shoot people. <laughs> Figured he'd come out here for, for the day or whatever and play games, have a possibility of winning some prizes and hang out with my buddies and just have a great time. Team Kaizen is off to a fast start in what they hope will be a road to a fourth consecutive win after dominating Soul Calibur 2. We'll see who snags the two points in Call of Duty coming up next on Arena. Coming up this week, we're telling you about the games of spring. And don't miss G4TV.retro, a classic episode of the show every day at 4 p.m. Not eight, cool. Oh, it's eight. Rated E for everyone. At Rainbow Studios, we wanted even the most dangerous stuff to look realistic. So we brought in our intern, Toby. Are you ready? Go! 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 Thanks to him, you can do things in this game you've never done before. Like go head-to-head -head with a monster truck, outrun a biplane, or jump a helicopter. Oh! You're the man, Toby. You're the man. MX Unleashed. Buried Treasure is brought to you by EB Games. I'm here at EB Games and I found myself a buried treasure. This is a game that I really loved. It's called Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. It was out for the PC and then LucasArts brought it out to the N64 in limited quantities. So it was very difficult to find. It's set in 1947, so World War II is over. Now he's facing the Soviet Red Army. Like every good Indiana Jones movie, there's all kinds of really cool environments in this game. You'll be running around in the snow. You'll go to the ruins in Babylon. You'll go to Egyptian ruins. Lots of tombs. He's got some rafting missions that he's got to take care of. The narrative is very good. There's some really cool voice acting in there. The guy actually sounds a little bit like Harrison Ford. The theme music is great to hear again. And there's tons of exploration and action in this game. It's a great find. It's called Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine for the Nintendo 64. This definitely is a buried treasure. Check out this and other buried treasures at EB Games. We take games seriously. Welcome back, everyone, to Arena. Now, before the break in the console round, Kaizen turned out to be Nim's worst nightmare, winning three or four rounds, which means Kaizen is one step closer to winning that all-expenses-paid trip at the end of this season. But hey, they got a long way to go. But not so far away from me is Kevin, who's right behind me. He'll set the stage for our next game. Kevin. Thanks, Lee. Yes, the game is Call of Duty, and it's a squad-based first-person shooter that drops players into the European trenches of World War II. Now, the game mode is headquarters, where the objective is to capture and defend a randomly placed radio. The map today is Rocket. 
Now, Rocket has an extensive underground bunker system which provides the opportunity for some close-range combat, while on the surface, the open environment offers ideal conditions for snipers. So let's see who will claim the two points for this round. One. Call of Duty is underway. Kaizen posing as those pesky Germans in the Axis doing a little Sprechensee Deutsch with Nim as those wonderful allies. Kevin, trying to capture the radio. Team Nim off to a quick start. Each 45 seconds yields 45 points. Once the enemy has it, if you destroy it, you get 25. Hey, we got to take it before 45's out. Member of Kaizen chucking some grenades. He goes prone behind a buddy and takes some fire. And now he's on the move. Weapon selection is key here, Lee. You need to plan for the uh, close quarter combat with a little automatic rifle. You can go with the sniper rifle for the outdoor long range firing. Two down, two more to go. Mac for Kaizen. Very nimble here on the landscape. Got one. Kaizen just picking off enemies. Wolves fighting his way out of that bunker. Quick firefight takes down a member of the opposing force but gets taken out himself. While Ringworm again seems the aggressor here for Team Kaizen. Here in Call of Duty, it's a 30 second respawn process. Kind of like being in purgatory. And it looks like Team Nim is securing the radio at this point. And as we all learned in history class, Lee, control of the radio is what turns the tide of war. Hey, we don't need two of you guys in there. Mastermind prone in the bunker, taking some fire, and he gets taken out. And I'm right behind you, though. Kaizen on the verge of turning the tables here. And it looks like Kaizen has successfully destroyed the radio, and now both teams are frantically making their way to the next random spawn. It's under, underground, underground, underground. Notice the communication by Team Kaizen letting each other know where the radio is and where certain enemies are at all times. I'm winding down here in round one. I'm in there. Uh, capturing. Ringworm for Team Kaizen is trying to grab control of that radio. He's got a teammate there to cover his back. First half of this round was spent outside, the second half inside. Tony Montana chucking some grenades around the corner trying to clear a room. Say hello to my little friend. And Montana gets taken down, unable to destroy the radio. <laughs> for all Kaizen here in round one of Call of Duty. Two. And round two underway, Kevin. Kaizen have been taken round one. No history here, so they just took it because they were better, I guess. Well, they had clear control of the radio the entire round. I think it's underneath. It's underneath, yeah. Both teams on the move right away. Tony Montana and Wildcard aggressively moving through the landscape. You can tell these guys know they have to be the aggressor now. And they've got to watch out for the team killing, Lee. Unfortunately, Nim took out a couple of their own members last round. Oh, Tony Montana going in and out of these bunkers in search of that radio. And down he goes, does Tony Montana. And Eska for Kaizen down in a bunker. Eska peeking around the corner with his whole body, not taking advantage of the lean feature in Call of Duty. And Wolves for Kaizen crouched atop the hill. Notice they leave him outside of the base so he's able to see which way the enemies are entering. Lee, excellent strategy. Hold outside, hold that door. Don't let him go through that door. Mac for Team Kaizen, prone atop the ladder, controlling the radio for the entire round. Wolves drops down behind a rock for some cover and takes out a member of Team Nim. So who's gonna have to take that from the top? Kaizen's in control of the radio right now, and a member of Team Nim trying to change that. He makes his way up the ladder, but runs into a prone member of Team Kaizen and gets taken out. When your character climbs that ladder, Lee, he puts his weapon in the holster, so unfortunately he's unable to fire until he makes it all the way up, and a member of Team Kaizen took advantage of that. And for the second time, using that same strategy, prone in front of the ladder, a member of Team Kaizen is able to defend the radio by taking out an enemy. Hey, we already won now. Just so do whatever you want. A little smack talking by Team Kaizen or stating the obvious, one of the two. And Team Nim finally regrouping around that hole, trying to make one final push towards the radio. Back for Team Kaizen, he spent most of his time right there just laying on the floor. Well, a single grenade through the window would be enough to take him out, but unfortunately, I don't have a keyboard and mouse in front of me. I think the radio might blow. Kaizen was in control of the radio so long, Lee, that the, the radio decided to self-destruct. It got that bored. Call of Duty round two goes to Team Kaizen. Three. Hey, oh, game's on. Round three underway here in Call of Duty. I just overheard Team Kaizen calling this a victory lap. And there's something to be said about a round so boringly that the, the radio decides to take its own life. Radio's place. Team Nim is looking for MVP points and total kills. Cody Montano moving around those bunkers in search of that radio. Eska for Kaizen went prone behind a tree, but unfortunately was not enough cover for him. And Tony Montana unloading on a member of Team Kaizen. Tony Montana takes down Woobs. Woobs, he did it again. Woobs. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Lee. You working out? Well, it looks like Nim has clearly stepped it up. They've eliminated several members of Team Kaizen early on here. And I believe Team Nim is actually in control of the radio, Lee. Team Nim hoping to rack up some of those MVP points as well as total kills. No more trash talking from them, guys. Hey, we're down 135 to 37. We need this radio. It's all Team Kaizen here making a push towards that radio. 
and ringworm for Kaizen, prone yet again inside of a bunker, waiting for an enemy to peek his head around the corner. The radio spawns right in front of ringworm, and he's securing it now. Let's see if Nim is able to take him out. Tony Montana opening fire, but decides to take a little nap in the snow. He gets taken out. He's outside. He threw a grenade. And if I'm not mistaken, ringworm just got blown to sh**. No, you're not mistaken, Mike. Eska for Kaizen takes out a member of Team Nim who was at that stationary turret. Two members of Team Kaizen crouched behind those boxes for cover as Tony Montana tries to flush him out, gets taken down around a corner. It looks like a member of Team Kaizen is at the radio. They're trying to secure it now as fire breaks out. There it is. There's the radio. Uh. And Eska for Kaizen gets mowed down. And Nim is at the radio now, crouched in a firefight, muzzle to muzzle. No one's left. No one's left. Get the radio. It's Nim goes down. It looks like ringworm for Kaizen is the last person left in the round. He's there to secure it. Bodies are everywhere. Nim had to get it going here in Call of Duty round three. Yeah, Kaiser lost. Finally. <laughs> and Nim takes round three, Kevin. All right, well, it wasn't the most exciting strategy of all, but Mac for Team Kaizen proved that a little patience goes a long way. His defensive prowess gave his team two points in our PC round, and now he's standing with Stacy Barcelata for his five seconds of fame. Thanks, Kevin. Congratulations, Mac. Let's talk about your Call of Duty defensive strategy. Well, really camped him out that map. Let the little jabronis come up, take off the heads. Real good fun. Two down, two down. You did a great job. How do you think the next round's going to go against Team Nim? Oh, we've been sessing SOCOM 2 real hard. No chance. Wow, no chance. Big words, maybe, but it ain't bragging if you back it up. Lee, isn't that what you always say? Or is it Kid Rock? Not Kid Rock. It's Kid Hawk. But while our teams prepare for battle in SOCOM 2, you can check out our website at g4tv.com slash arena, where you can read player profiles and sign up your team to get on the show. Our final showdown in SOCOM 2 is coming up after this on Arena. Welcome back, everyone, to Arena. Now, before the break, Kaizen rewrote history and led the Germans to victory in Call of Duty. So it looks like Team Nim needs a near-perfect round of SOCOM 2 and needs that cumulative score bonus to have a chance to match. Let's go to Kevin to set it up. Thank you, Lee. Yes, our third and final game is SOCOM 2 U.S. Navy SEALs. And a coin flip before the show determined that Team Nim will be the SEALs and Team Kaizen will be the opposing force. Now, the mode for today's game is extraction, where the SEALs must infiltrate their opponent's stronghold to rescue a group of hostages. Today's map is Fishhook, which is set in a seaside village that, like Lee, has seen better days. What? Now, this setting has plenty of opportunities for close quarters combat, but it's also a sniper's paradise. So let's see which approach our two teams take as they square off in SOCOM 2 U.S. Navy SEALs. One. In SOCOM 2 U.S. Navy SEALs is underway. Kevin Kaizen won the toss and elected to be the bad guys. I love SOCOM. SOCOM's cool. SOCOM is the fun. And NIM are the U.S. Navy SEALs. Team NIM, their objective is to find the hostages, get them to safety. Team Kaizen, their objective is to keep the hostages. And Woobs is there. Hey, don't shoot each other, guys. Oh my gosh, Sean the fail. And Tony Montana gets fragged by a member of Team NIM. They killed themselves. They did? Back for Team Kaizen, standing back, moving the hostages to an alternate location, trying to make things difficult for Team NIM. Plus, you got downstairs, good? Yeah, all right, you got all the hostages? Yep. And it looks like Ringworm for Team Kaizen, laying down a couple mines, hoping that a member of Team NIM runs unsuspectingly into a room. Eska for Team Kaizen, now in charge of babysitting those hostages. 
be the defense here is much easier than the offense. Absolutely, Lee. Uh, Team Kaizen has the advantage on this round. They can move the hostages to wherever they would like and then strategically plant themselves and wait for Team Nim to show up. Ralph, they're coming your way. Oh, oh really? Ringworm for Team Kaizen leaning out around that corner, checking for enemies. Slap shoes for Team Nim making his way off the beach. I think he should oh. get farther away. So you can see out in the open there, he's a sitting duck, he has slap shoes. Again, an example of why it's more difficult to be a U.S. Navy SEAL in SOCOM 2. Team Nim having trouble locating the hostages. Very aggressive, his slap shoes. Again, Nim way behind on points here. And down go slap shoes. Out. Out. Nice. Mac for Team Kaizen took down slap shoes. And it looks like only one member remains for Team Nim. Will he be able to get to those hostages, Lee? Well, again, it's becoming all academic for Kaizen, being dominant here in SOCOM 2 U.S. Navy SEALs. Max up on the rooftop. Oh, wait, I got hit once. Fire rings out. He goes prone to avoid it. He's on this roof. A little bit of communication from Team Kaizen, trying to get a beat on the enemy, let each other know exactly where he is. Kaizen now playing the waiting game. Wild card for Team Nim. Leaning out around the corner, he spots a member of the opposing force, and now he's, he's just waiting for him to sneak back out. But Hey, why don't you come out? Wild it's already card. over. Homeboy oh, talks a lot of noise. Which corner? <laughs> Taking his time, and now some fires exchanged between Wildcard, and he gets oh. taken out. It looks like Team Nim will be unable to take round one of So Calmly. Oh, and of course, a little showboating, a little victory dance there. Probably a little moonwalk. Why not? Two. Round two underway? Or am I imagining things? Nim all but beaten and battered here, and So Calm 2 U.S. Navy SEALs has proven to be no different for them, Kevin. Slap shoes for Nim, wasting no time. Coming in off the beach, makes his way across the street unscathed up until this point. Busby, where are you? Uh, don't go downstairs, because I have the door set. The hostages have reset back to their initial starting point. Let's see if Nim is able to locate him this round. Prior to this game, Kevin, we had talked about Nim needing a very dominant SOCOM 2. Slap shoes just starts blowing up stuff. He's ticked off. And Eska just took out Mastermind Lee. They put a mine on the ground. I can't see mines. This bull And fire breaks out. Slap shoes in a firefight. And he takes out a member of Team Kaizen. I'm down. No, 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 you can go down down ready. By the hallway. Looks like Woobs for Kaizen gets taken out. You're gonna need a lot more than that, Kevin. Tony Montana actively searching for those hostages. Eska for Kaizen up top. You got both of them set? Um, doing it right now. Once again, Nim, the U.S. Navy SEAL team. And Mac for Kaizen with an excellent shot takes down Slap Shoes. Excellent shooting by Mac as Mac from up top unloads, and it looks like all of the Navy SEALs have been eliminated, Lee. Oh, boo! Yeah. It's like shooting ducks in a barrel. Three. And it's all over, but the fat lady's singing. She's singing about round three, Lee. <laughs> Rounds one and two, all Kaizen. And Nim, only an unbelievable miracle here in the third round of SOCOM 2 U.S. Navy SEALs will salvage any face here for them. Mastermind and Slap Shoes heading out together as wild card for Nim. Makes his way, and he's already in a, in a firefight with a member of the opposing force. It's a little circle strafing in the street, and Wildcard goes down. Team Nim is now three strong yet again. Wildcard went down fast. Tony Montana. Getting a little choked up. I know it's getting a little sad choked to see up. seals get taken out this way. But... Tony Montana hoping not to see a similar fate in a firefight with Mac. Oh, and and he... down goes Tony Montana. And it looks like Mac for Kaizen took down Tony Montana, but now he's pausing to reload and takes down yet another member of Team Nim. Mac is on a killing spree. That was mastermind for Nim that went down. From behind. Oh, man. And the round is over, Lee. That's rough. Yeah. Freaking spree right there. That's dance time, USA. And Mac for Kaizen. Oh. Doing his best beat it. So calm too, electric boogaloo. Nim is destroyed, and SOCOM 2 is all Team Kaizen. Well, SOCOM 2 proved that you have to work as a team to survive here in Arena, and Mac proved to be a Mac truck as he plowed through Team Nim, leading Kaizen to victory. With an excellent performance in Call of Duty and SOCOM 2, there's no doubt who today's MVP is. Let's go to Stacy with our winning team and our MVP. Team Kaizen, Mac, get on up here. You are the MVP today. You did great in two games. How are you feeling? Ah, it's complete ownage. They couldn't do anything. Only one of them left. Only one of them left. You guys did own them. Now, next time you're going for win five and the Hall of Champions, how are you going to make sure that happens? We're unstoppable. We don't have to do anything. Oh, backflip. Unstoppable. Congratulations, Team Kaizen. Lee, take it away.
Ownage and unstoppable. I like these guys. Now it's a new season, but an over result as Kaiser returns and successfully defends his title against an overmatched and an overwhelmed team with a clean sweep. And now they're only one big win away from being the first team in season three to qualify for the Hall of Champions and the chance of winning that all expenses paid week of fun in the sun courtesy of Arena. We'll see if Kaizen has a stuff of champions on the next episode of Arena. This week on Sweat, Rossi heads to Houston to game with the NFL's best at the Madden Bowl. What you doing on the ground, man? Come on. Hang out at the hottest parties. And it's live, man. And talk NFL fever with league MVP Peyton Manning. People are going to start beating me now when I play them. That's why you come to Madden Bowl, and that's what it's all about. Get in on the action with a special pigskin party edition of Sweat, Saturday at 4.30 p.m. Presented by Jeep. If it's not trail rated, it's not a Jeep 4x4. <laughs> Use the crystals to expel the mist that poisoned your world. Battle alone or with friends by connecting up to four Game Boy Advance systems. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, only for Nintendo GameCube. Rated D for teen. Here we see a wild Pikmin in its natural environment. These strange creatures become attached to whoever pulls them from the ground, loyal and obedient. Pikmin work together to fight large predators like this grub dog, even if it means getting eaten. As night falls, the Pikmin return to their nests to rest for another day of hard work. Hang in there, little guys. Pikmin. Only for Nintendo GameCube. Rated E for everyone. So many cool things going on at the G4 booth this year, but one of the coolest things is they're giving out free tattoos. Not little fake tattoos that you put on with water. The real deal. Needle and ink going in your skin. One thing is, it's got to have the G4 logo in it. This shows dedication, that's for sure. Yes, first time. Oh, wow. The pain purifies. Hardcore, dude. Nice. My devotion to video games. Yeah. They were like free tattoos, and I was like, well, that sounds good. They were like G4 logo, and I was like, that sounds even better. They gave that to me, dude. G4 is a great station. They usually leave it on 24-7. It was just insane the first time I saw it. It's awesome. I need to call my cable provider. I watch it all the time. I'll start watching it now. <laughs> so watch G4 TV for gamers. Adam, people always ask me, what is Adam Sessler really like? Is he really a geek and a dork like he acts on TV, or is it phony? And I tell him, no way. Adam is no phony. He is the real deal. Thank you, Tina. I, I really do appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it is so true, guys. This guy is truly a geek yeah. and a dork. Stop it. Stop, yeah. it. stop it. Stop it. I just want the audience to know that you two gals are about as authentic as they come. Thanks, awesome. Adam. That's people, awesome. Thank you. These ladies are exactly as you see them on the show. Caddy. And annoyed. There yeah. is nothing bogus going on here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Adam. That's so sweet. I mean, we really respect our audience. We know people can smell what's fake, you know? Totally. And you guys, there's <laughs> nothing fake about Tino except those two things. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. I'm just saying. Okay, Why I'm, would you I'm, say that on TV? I'm getting a little well, uncomfortable, so okay, I'm just going to floss. Your hat looks ridiculous. You shouldn't be embarrassed. Well, you made out with your first cousin. I didn't tell anybody on TV. Can you make a quality RPG using nothing more than a half-assed understanding of Confucianism? We'll find out with Jade Empire. And we'll take a look at Midnight Club 3 and ask if the world needs yet another illegal street racer. And I'm Leslie Stahl. These stories <laughs> and Andy Rooney tonight on G4TV.com. Everybody and welcome to the show that changes boy toys more often than Michael Jackson. Oh, <laughs> hey, bad. Hey, hey. You're bad. Hey, it's true. It's true. Anyway, Adam, it's so awesome to have another blonde, spiky hair person on the show. As you know, these brunettes are really bringing us down. 
Well, you know, the spiky, that's that's really kind of the I, I think it's more like sprouty. I was like, thinking like, of yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. 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 uh, bleach blonde, right? Natural, it goes this way. <laughs> exactly. Just like this. And you know, I know I'm a big fan of Morgan. Tina and Morgan. No, it's not that we get along. We're friends. Except mm -hmm. for all the video evidence to the contrary. Exactly. That's all. That's all. We're working through our problems. We're, we're seeing somebody. You're working it through. Not on the same television. person, but we're seeing like therapist type talking to somebody. Right. So we're working it out. But how's your show going? Excellent. The show is going yeah. fine. Um, it's still on the air, and uh, so I just, I just check every night, and then uh -huh. I know okay, I can go into work tonight. Well, and it's not just on the air. It's on the air about seventy times a day. Adam says. That is true. That's true. Right. So if you ever miss me, there's no lack which of I do, <laughs> Right. I know where to find oh, myself. We miss you all the time, which is why we decided to have you back on a Great. second time. What games are people right. playing? What people talking well, about? Well, the big one, it's uh, Jade Empire. This yeah. is BioWare's RPG, and of course it's such a big deal because BioWare made Nice of the Old Republic, yeah. and we're behind Nice of the Old Republic 2, and the original KOTOR was, in, in, in our opinion, on X-Play, you know, the best game mm -hmm. of 2003. Yes. Um, I cannot stand turn-based RPGs, and it actually made me love them. Of course, Jade Empire is a significantly different game because it involves combat, and it's real-time combat, right. and it takes place in a mystical Chinese That's land. right. Yes. And a, a not based setting. on ancient China, but a it, mystical China. We talked a little bit about the combat. You had a little bit of problems with it, but oh, let's yeah. find out what people on the board are saying. Adam Barnes wrote in, he's from Florence, Alabama, and says the story is one of the coolest things about Jade Empire. Death's Hand is one of the most intriguing villains I've seen since Darth Vader. Now, I may agree it's got a great story, but I just think there's way too much reading in this RPG to get uh, to really get into. Adam, do you agree with me on that? Well, I mean, do you think it's more reading compared to KOTOR, or do you think there's too much reading in KOTOR I just as well? think it's too much reading in the RPG in general. I'm not an RPG fan mm -hmm. whatsoever, so I can't say that it's not a great game. Right. It's just not my style of game, but I still feel for an RPG, it just got a lot of, t it's very text heavy at the beginning. But, hey, Adam, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. I actually played the game with the subtitles turned off, mm -hmm. which I kind of like the experience that, that that brought. But, but I, I didn't think that it was really that much of a problem. That's um, interesting that you did that because I actually turned it, played it with the sound off so I could click through and read as fast <laughs> as I wanted to because the voice acting is too right. slow for me. I, 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 I have found that with, with, with all of their games that, that once, you know, you've already gotten through the sentence by reading it and they're still right. kind of lingering on the words. I think it's a problem that with, in a lot of games, that, that voice work is, tends to be a little bit too ponderous. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, are, there are a few games that, that are exceptions. Right. Now, Adam, how do you, did you play KOTOR as well from Bioware? I did. That's, uh, it was an awesome game. How, I do you, how do you compare this to KOTOR? Um, it's not quite as good. I don't think it's the classic that Knights of the Old Republic was. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot to like about it. I mean, the story was amazing. The characters were re really interesting. And, uh, well, you know, talk about the combat, Adam, because we're used to seeing the turn based, and like we were talking about at, at yeah. this, Adam, Adam, and Adam. <laughs> uh, it's it's real time. Does that pull you out of it, or do you prefer just seeing the turn based like we did in Kotor? I, well, I, I thought the combat in Jade Empire it kind of works for the game, but it, it's not as as big of yeah. you know. It's it's, 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 it's nowhere near as polished. Yeah. Just, it doesn't have that. It's, it felt kind of clunky. I don't know, Adam, if you play God of War, but I found that to be the biggest problem. After coming off of this, this just sublime combat system in God oh, of right. War, Perfect. to then go to what felt kind of just kind of jerky and unsure of itself. Almost a half ass fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no, the other thing the is... The combat think, is definitely not one of the best things about the game. Yeah. But I, I think it, it does the job that it's really supposed to. So what do you feel like is the best thing about the game? Uh, definitely the story. I would, the story. I would agree with him. But don't you just want to go and read the book? <laughs> I mean, it's a video game. Pick up the novel. Yeah. I'd like to keep my, mini, uh, my reading in my video game will compare to like a reading the back of your shampoo bottle. Like, we want to keep it just the basic instructions. Otherwise, I'll go get by a novel. It, it could be a good book, but, it, you know, when you, when you play a game and you read a book, it's, just a, it's a different experience. Understandable. Personally, right. I'm going to have to say that I felt more of a connection with the characters in KOTOR than I did here because... It's, you know, text heavy from the first two hours and then it lightens up here in Jade Empire, but the first two hours they just throw so much at you it was, that it yes. was confusing at points, you know, and I'm an intelligent woman. And they use but big they words, which you've always had a problem words, with. Big words, you know, with like multiple <laughs> syllables. Yes, exactly. No, seriously, there was just so much background and so much history that it was like, I wanted to take notes to make sure I was catching it all because part of me just wanted to get to the gameplay that I wasn't reading as thoroughly as I was. And there's always that fear like, oh my God, am I missing something important? Exactly. Because you're still trying yeah. to get used to it. I think also, I was, I was a little put off at first story-wise just because the thing was, I, I kept on feeling it was about to veer into this land of stereotypes. So that was, it was me like, ah, even though I guess Star you. Wars. Right. I think yeah. it totally did. Star Wars, I mean, Star Wars is a world of stereotypes, but they're ones that are kind of original, of course. I, th right. I think Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, it had a couple of really good characters, you know, 
the HK robot, he was, he was awesome. But well, we just oh, haven't yeah. seen enough Star Wars games, though. That's the problem. I know there's such a shortage. There is. Yeah. Yeah. I wish they do one like based on the. Lego I wish there were like three more bad movies that I can watch yeah. so they can make more games. <laughs> Episode based 97. On but Adam, so are you recommending people to pick up this as an RPG or not pick this up? Well, um, if, if you really like not to the old public, I think you'll probably enjoy the game. Um, but be yeah. disappointed in comparison. You're right. I yeah. got, it, 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 it's not going to match up. I, I think the thing I find so interesting is that I, would, I don't like turn-based games. I thought, totally. oh, cool, real-time right. fighting, yay, 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 yay. And then I played it, and I really missed the turn-based fighting because when I was playing Nice to the Older Public, I loved, like, setting up all my neat attacks and sitting back and, and watching me just, you know, really? kick butt Which is all what I hate place. about that no. game, which is me going, oh. if I'm going to be, that's the one thing I actually really enjoyed about Jade Empire is for me to sit back and go, okay, I'm, I'm going to kick your ass, but first I'm going to say I'm going to right punch, left punch, right. left, and then I go, now go do it. There's something about that, it, it's sort of, it just, it's much more passionate when you go right into combat. Now you're kicking ass, and there's no setting, I, you know, yeah, setting I found it agree with I, you. I, I, Sister. Oh, I brought the two of you together. That's not fair. I'm driving away. All right, we got to take a quick break. Laura has to go throw up for breakfast. But upon our return, we're going to find out if Rockstar delivers with Midnight Club 3. If you stop calling me fat, I wouldn't have to do these things. Well, you gained a little Pausing. bit. I'm trying Pausing. to let you, you Pausing. Know, I don't want you to be embarrassed on television. <laughs> That's it. Lip, lip to the right. Oh. Oops. The cold silence of space only punctuates the feeling of death that emanates from this virtually lifeless planet. Only one thing is alive and well here. Evil. And it must be destroyed, decimated, exterminated. It must be found. Me and my brother, we were playing like to see who was better. So we like stayed up all night until three o'clock just seeing who see who's better. Then my little nephew came, we disconnected everything. We started screaming like, God no, we didn't even save the game. Then my nephew just went running to his mom and I got mad because we spent all day. Oh my God no. Little bastard. This is Father Adrian Gonzalez. I just want to say that I will be renouncing my religion of Christianity to worship the Greco-Roman gods thanks to the awesome video game of God of War. It really did change my life. Why is every single time there's not a naked chick or lots of violence in a game, people always say, oh, it's Kitty, and don't play it. Is the game fun? Yes, then shut up and play it. I want somebody to make a Tony Danza game and call it Extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> I like the I like the religious one. That's so it's like awesome. the new Kabbalah. Well, we're, 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 we're bringing spirituality to the world. Yeah, I, because, I, yeah there's positive things: religion, I hear sex, Tom violence. Getting in a car to come over and the here reason now. it's a kitty game is we don't have sex, drugs, and rock and roll because that's all adults do. Yeah, exactly. So hey, you. welcome back. Oh, really? Adam Sessler of X Play Fame is joining us. Yes. We couldn't afford Morgan, but we're very excited that you're here. Well, I, mean, I, I heard there's a fruit basket for me afterwards. Uh, actually, Morgan, Morgan ate, ate it. it but, but, but we're really excited you're here, core. and you look great. I love your shirt. We right. tried on a couple shirts before. Yeah, we did. And, this and, is and, the and, one and we, we settled with on. this. And, yeah. uh, well, we know what the kids say about my shirts, what it does to their members. And yes, we'll, we'll, but, but, but anyway. Okay. Hey, that's for X Play. This but beyond Jade Empire, Empire, what's everybody talking about? All right, so now Rockstar Games put out another game. No, it's not Grand Theft Auto. And no, it's not Save Emergency. Thankfully, it's not Save <laughs> right. Emergency. Yes. It's uh, their venerable street racing series, Midnight Club. This is number three yes. with Dub Edition. Dub Edition. Uh, once Dub. again, this is this is legal street racing. You may have heard of it. If you haven't, I want to hug you. Oh, wow, what an uh, original idea. I know, isn't All that? right, you guys. Lay, okay, we know that the genre is flooded, but this is a really solid game. It's based game. on a Vin Diesel movie from four years ago. It, it, but you, even though the genre is still saturated, just like there's lots of RPGs and there's True. lots of first-person shooters, based, but mm -hmm. if a good one comes yes. out, you've got to give it props. Because I believe, I may be wrong, I believe when the first Midnight Club came out, which was right around the beginning of yep. the PS2, this hadn't become such a fad. I thought it was a cool game. Yes. I, I just... I, 
think I feel a sense of exhaustion. Okay. Now. Well, let's see what people on the board are saying. Yeah, let's see what people All on the right. boards. Am I the only one who is sick and tired of seeing one illegal street <laughs> racing game after another? And that is from Michael Boyd from Breckenridge, Colorado. And Michael, you are not alone. Are you with me? Yeah, how's it going? Good. Now, what do you think of illegal street racing games as a whole? Well, as a whole, I think they suck, pretty much. They suck, but do you, I an mean, individual... Hold up. Uh, <laughs> Tina's about to chew you out, but hold on. I'm, I'm going to get you back here for a second. Have you played Midnight Cup 3? Let's start with that. Yeah, I played, I played Midnight Cup 3. I, I actually think it's, out of all the legal street racing games, it's probably one of the better ones. I, Thank you. Okay. I, That's I all I'm asking okay. for. Thank you. <laughs> I just want someone to come up and say, yes, but this conversation is not about the genre in general. It's about Midnight Club 3 because that's what people are playing. Mm -hmm. It's got online capability. It's got the deepest customization mode that I've seen in a, in a legal street racing game. And I just oh. think it's a really, if you like racing games, which you don't like, Laura. I don't like racing games. I you don't know? like driving in real life, nor do I like doing it virtually. Right. And I don't think out of your people you're hit a fan me of with it, cars. Yeah. yeah. And out of the three, this is by far the best. I did not I, like I, I Midnight Club yeah, 1 and 2. Well, my, very my, difficult. What do you like about played, the game? But I think. The genre as a whole is really kind of, it's get, getting really tired. I mean, there's, there's on Need for Speed Underground, they're making a new one, like uh -huh. Most Wanted or something like that. Let's discuss, but, what is it that you like so much about it that makes it uh, above and beyond the others? Well, I like the customization, mm -hmm. like adding all the parts to it and, you know, tricking it out and all that. Totally. I like the um, Xbox Live support. Yep. Playing online, because, well, you play, if you play single player, you, get, you, you think you're pretty good, but then you go up against real people and you can... Kind of get a better, right. Real better people view on are how, how good you actually are. Right. Oof, totally I'm right. to say though, I'm, I'm, I was a little disappointed in Rockstar. They're just so becoming cliche. The characters, like the opening screen, comes out this Latin like thug type guy. And trust me, normally have you played Grand Theft Auto? I know, and that's what I'm saying. I that's believe that. Yeah, from the Department they, of Cheap Stereotypes. Well, they've exhausted actually the, actually the college Club too. They had characters that were cliche as well, like. Yeah, and just like a, like a Vin Diesel character kind of guy and yeah, a bunch of other nonsense like that. And it is very stereotypical, and I think we, I get that the whole genre is saturated and stuff, Michael and stuff, but you just got to give props to a, a good game that still comes out with solid gameplay. I'm a street racing fan. I like the online. No, it's not completely innovative. It didn't invent something brand right. new that we haven't but seen before. But you didn't like the other two. No, I didn't. They were really difficult, and they've got these arrows that are really tough to see sometimes, mm -hmm. and they're really, I think they really yeah, think tackled this problem. This, one, been this one's the best one I played. Probably the best street racing game I played. I didn't even think one or two were even playable. It was so frustrating. You got lost all the time. Right. Well, I think what's, what's, what's going to be sad is, I, I mean, I, I agree. This other genre is probably one of its, its, its best examples. But Need for Speed Underground just somehow has a lock on this. Yeah. And people can't seem to look outside of it. I'm really curious to see if Rockstar, by virtue of them being, being Rockstar, Rockstar right. will be able to at least show people an alternative so it will force you to try to make a better game. And I think, yeah. I think Need for Speed Underground is, is, is just a... Is, it's, it's a disc that's an ad. I mean, it's just right. it's nearly... So, yeah, well, so you it, prefer this game? Too. Oh, I would play this game. I would recommend this game to other people who like this type of game, and I would right. steer them clear of Neighbor Speed Underground, where the customization there right. is, is, is so superficial, it has no actual bearing on, on, what, on how the car really performs. But it's missing one thing. <laughs> it's missing boobs and, and ass. Yes, but... I'm about to say, and I being a connoisseur of that from <laughs> yeah. a distance. Right, I, right. I've never that's really what I've heard about you. If you can't, yeah. office the girls. Well, that and the cars and a, a, a highly colorful character. <laughs> Two highly colorful characters are found on the whip set, and, and that's obviously on Sunday nights Is here same? at G4 10 o'clock. at 10 p.m. So if you're so a car you enthusiast, go. you can actually watch a little bit of our You don't even have to like cars. I well, you guys won't watch it because you're not car enthusiasts. All right, we got a break for a couple of minutes. Laura has to throw up her snack, but when we come back, it's all about you. We're scanning the forums and answering your really, really, really tough and personal questions about that one thing that you did that one night. I feel sick. They found out. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome back to the show. We're having a fantastic time. Adam Sessler's joining us. It's been a blast. You look fantastic, by the you way. Look really? You look great. You, you look know, great. the minute someone says that to me, like, the yeah. hair's in the back of my neck stand up, because I know <laughs> something bad's about to happen. Well, yeah. you have something on your nose, but it, don't even worry about it. We're not even noticing that. All right. I like the hairs on the back of your neck, Adam. Okay. Okay, stop. Mm -hmm. Hi. Don't, don't hey, make slide. me floss. All right, on the show, Adam, Laura, <laughs> yes. settle down. Tina. We really pride ourselves in bringing top game developers and company executives to oh. give you guys great previews and to get thoughts on what's coming up, right? It's important. But what we're missing are the people on the front lines. Yeah. Right? Those guys that know what people are renting, what they're buying, what they're selling, and what they're replaying. Yes. It's a gaming trench foot. That's exactly what, what it is. So we decided to go to America's Heartland to meet our soldier. Aye, aye. <clears throat> His name is Shane Should Hoffman. He's the manager at Maple Grove, <laughs> Minnesota Game Zone. So yeah. we're going to call him up right now, and we're going to ask him a couple questions. We want to know what the game community is doing. We want to know. So From we're going to go ahead and... help you. 
Hey, Shane, how are you? This is hey, Tina Wood from G4. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay. How are you guys doing? We're doing Good. fantastic. So we just want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, thanks for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Um, what are people renting right now? Uh, tons of people are asking for Revenge of the Sith. They just have to wait a few more days, mm -hmm. but I think it's going to be an awesome game. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of God of War, we were selling all that game like crazy. It just cannot keep it on the shelf. Understand that game so. makes people change their religion. I just want to know. They they go monotheistic and polytheistic. I have to say, I was just at Star Wars Celebration three, mm -hmm. and they had the Revenge of the Sith game there. This is the first time I've seen a move like a, a Star Wars game based on one of the movies that looks like a legitimate game. It's being done by the Collective, which have had some hit or miss, but some pretty good stuff with Indiana Jones and uh, uh, the. And, and Buffy, mm. but this has real saber So it's not combat. just like fanboys being excited about it. It's going to be a legitimate game. I mean, the best way we could describe it is kind of like the Return of the King and the Two Towers games in Star Wars. Right. This was now, now, Shane, what can you not get rid of? What's just stacked on your shelves that yeah. you can't sell fast enough? Uh, Halo 2. Um, <laughs> yeah. oh, really? Well, it's been out for a while. Let's cut it, up, cut it some slack. And what about, are people returning anything? Um, yeah, a lot of uh, trade-ins right now in Time Splitters. It's a great game, but it's incredibly short. People have been complaining about the length of it. Like, it's all about the multiplayer, but mm -hmm. if you don't have online, it's pretty much, you know, just play for six, seven hours, you're done with it. So, so. really, no, so we're seeing no replayability in Time Splitters? Um, to a certain extent, you got to have the online. Like, it's a total online game. I mean, online is the future of gaming. If you don't have online, you're pretty much going to get left, you know, back in I the agree. Stone Age. Somebody tell Nintendo. It's yeah. the same thing that we said about Time Splitters, actually, on a review. If you're, if you're aiming for the single player, you have nothing. And yeah. If you don't like multiplayer, don't buy it. Now, we, we just previewed Star Wars Legos, which I was a huge fan of. Can you tell me anything exciting about Star Wars Legos? Is it flying off your shelves? Oh, yeah. I mean, I throw it in for, like, ten minutes, and a family comes in, they buy it instantly. It's just the most fun game I've played in a long time. The family buys it for their small children. Let's yeah. point out that. Thank oh, you. you always have something oh, negative to add. Wow. Shane, we really appreciate it. And how's your day going? You having a good day? Yeah, you know, it's awesome. Uh, good weather. People are coming in, you know, checking out all the new stuff that came out this week. So it's a good day. All right, well, we're going to all call your store and hope that you get a raise. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Shane, thank so much. Shane. We appreciate we'll it. check in again it's soon. A, you know what it is? It's interesting to kind of go out into the community and really find out what people are really spending. Because we get the numbers coming in. We get right. the executives saying, get stats. my game's great. But this is a guy who's saying, look, this is what people are actually really doing. So right. we, maybe we'll call around a couple of different stores. And, and if anyone wants Halo 2, now you know where. Uh, yeah. it's get over to Minnesota. I, say, I, I, I saw track. that guy. He's like, where can I find it? <laughs> exactly. I'm glad people are playing and enjoying and buying God of War. because yeah. Well, that's fantastic. And it's interesting game. about Time Splitters. I actually thought that it would have more replayability, that the online would be a little bit more effective, mm -hmm. but obviously not. The single not, player you know? is really, the AI is pretty bad. Yeah, I do agree with you. No, okay. yes, Sort of. No. Do I agree with you? You do. <laughs> no, you you do. Don't make a habit of it. All right, everybody needs a little tweaking now and then. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. So dirty. Maybe you're tired of your tweaking? old duds, or you're just too old for that short, blonde, spiky hair covered oh. by a multicolored beret. Well, we have a gamer makeover coming your way right after the break, so don't go anywhere. Don't change that dial. Do you have to go back to the fake issue? Do people have people know? dials anymore? Did I just no, age myself? Dial. David and Am I 60 Hi, my name is Laurent Dobas, and I hold the short mode record for the Elysium Alps course on SSX. It took me only nine months to achieve this score. Four friends of mine, also in their 30s, purchased the system and the game so they could play too. When the PS2 came around, my life changed. The first SSX was a revelation for me. Awesome graphics on what video games are supposed to be all about. Once I realized the million points barrier could be broken, I had to keep trying. I had to do it. It was a hot summer afternoon and I was just out of the shower. I turned on my PS2, my VCR, and bang, I hit the million points on my first run. I was shaking like crazy and unable to play after that for a couple of hours. It was pretty insane. Hi, I'm Jay Smith, creator of Vectrex. Do you know your exercise? Do you know your history? G4, TV for gamers. Ready? Ready to fight! Left and punch, right and kick, hit him with your dragon stick! Uppercut! Uppercut! Fireball! Fireball! Finish him! Next week, prepare for 
for the ultimate trip as we evaluate Tim Schafer's new title, Psychonauts. And we sit down with LucasArts and Star Wars Episode 3. Good times. Good times. Make sure to tune in. Now, you guys, Axe Body Wash came to us, and they offered a free makeover to one of our viewers. Mm -hmm. And judging by the gamers that hang around the G4 offices, some gamers could use a makeover. <coughs> <laughs> Tina. <laughs> you guys. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Sorry. a bunch of you guys wrote in. Tina wrote in a bunch too, but that's a different story. But a bunch of you wrote in. So right now, let's take a look at the very lucky recipient of an Axe Body Wash Makeover. <laughs> Roll it. So I want to thank everyone out there who entered the Axe Body Wash Makeover Contest. We got thousands of entries, but there was one guy who seemed a little bit more stylistically stunted than the rest of you. His name's Jonah. Here he comes. Now, Jonah, we're going to make you look so good that your girlfriend's panties are going to take themselves off. Come on. Yeah. Now, we're at the Vaxburg Salon, LA's premier salon for celebrity makeovers. And this here is my stylist, Andy Scarborough. We're going to make you look so hot. We've gone out, we pulled a bunch of clothes that I think are going to look really good on you, and I think you're going to like them. You guys ready? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Jonah's going to get naked. Let's do it. Jonah doesn't know this, but we've secretly flown in his girlfriend, Cindy, to be a part of this special surprise. What do you think of Jonah's look? Uh, Jonah's look is going downhill. Going downhill, you huh? Know, it seems like there's a scent emanating from his body. Let me tell you something. We've given him some Axe body wash to take care of the scent, so don't worry about what? that. And we've given him a whole bunch of other surprises that I really, really think you're going to like. Okay, have a seat. Let me go get your man. Jonah, we've got a surprise for you. One, two, three. Yeah. Hi, honey. Look how good he looks. I got my belt. Oh, I got you. Love my it. My bracelet. This. I look like Laura Ford. Yeah. You like it? Oh, my God. You look horrible. You don't like it? God. What's you the problem? Horrible. I did this for you. Jonah. Don't forget your axe body wash. <laughs> Only you would dress great. somebody up and make them look I exactly you like yourself. Great. Well, given the fact that I actually used to look like that as well, right? Dude, it's a good look. Yeah, it explains why the women ran. <laughs> yes, I'm sure people now are really writing Jonah, in to be part of this I think he, I think he looked great. What more could you want? Yes. Anybody, we're out of time. So we want to thank everybody for kicking around the old controller with us today. Especially thanks to the sets for filling in the incredibly large ash cushion. cushion left by Jeff Keighley. that was Keighley. a cushion? Mm. I thought it was an after dinner mint. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's why we love to it's have you around, Adam so Sessler. wrong on so many levels. And, Tina, I want to thank you for making me look good just by being here. Absolutely. All anytime, right. Anytime. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, Adam. I see you out there. Still trying to be fly with that 10-year-old cassette player? Come on, dog. Join us in the 21st century. How does a $20,000 interior car makeover sound to you? Watch G4 for clues every night from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Then go to G4TV.com to enter the whip set sweepstakes. Four new clues drop every night. The more you watch, the more chances you have to win. Please believe it's the whip set sweepstakes, May 8th through May 21st. Tune in, geek out, game on. It's time for E305. Boom! We've got an entire week of the biggest, baddest video game event of the year. G4 is teaming up with IGN to bring you two hours a day of live coverage from the show floor. Get ready for huge games and even huger gamers. It doesn't get any more electrifying than this. E305 Live, presented by Jeep, starting May 16th at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific.